Testing, testing, testing. Good to go? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Chairman Valone, and we are starting our ADC hearing today, almost on time. I uh, want to welcome everyone. As you can see, our hearings are very friendly and open family, pre-Thanksgiving style is the way I like it. Uh, just please, if you see any drool coming down the left side, please let me know. I still have Novocaine from my tooth extraction, bad timing, but God is funny sometimes with these things. Um, so we should see. So if you have any strange questions coming out of me, I'm going to blame it on the, 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 the what's going on in my mouth. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I have to say for those who uh, allowed me to tour and go through, I thank you for making me one of the family. I felt a lot of good conversation about me and my dad as the first speaker and going back the history at the site. And thanks for everyone at EDC and the mayor's office for getting us up to speed. That's what today's hearing is about. It's kind of an overview where we were in the past, where we are today, where we hope to be in the future at Hunts Point. So we are here once again to discuss the economic impact of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center upon the city in terms of services it provides, the land where it is situated, and the people it employs on the Hunts Point Peninsula and the Bronx. You tried as many syllables as possible today, so it's as many for anyway. I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing work being done by my colleague, Council Member Rafael Salamanca. Our land use chair is on the way. We're also joined by Council Member Peter Koo. Uh, in the Bronx, Council Member Salamanca has been implement instrumental in helping and improving what's happening at the Hunts Point wholesale and residential communities. The Distribution Center, or FDC for short, is one of the largest food distribution centers in the world. It is comprised of three large cooperative markets selling meat, fish, produce, as well as other private large food distributors. The land used for the markets is predominantly city-owned, and it is separately leased to each of the cooperatives and food distributors using the city's EDC as its conduit. Last year, EDC and the Meat Cooperative recently negotiated the new 40-year lease term that expires in 2058. The fish market's lease is through 2054, and the produce market's lease extension expires next year in 2021. Council Member Salamanca and I toured the meat and produce markets last week, where we were confronted with several of the overlapping issues facing FDC, ranging from jurisdiction over parcels of land at Hunts Point, the need for market facility improvements and space, regulatory burdens and food businesses face on a daily basis, and the climate resiliency concerns raised due to much of the food distribution center's perilous close location within the 100-year floodplain. During Hurricane Sandy, much of Hunts Point was spared a cat catastrophic event since the storm hit at low tide. If it had been high tide when Sandy passed through, the results could have been catastrophic for the market and for the tri-state region's ability to access fresh food. In conversations with the meat market cooperative last week, we learned that the area lost power for 36 hours, which is about as much time as they can handle. Any longer, and the estimate there would have been about two, two million in direct economic losses for the markets and the local economy. In recent years, I know Council Mampa Salamaga, who just showed up, has been dedicated to improving the climate resiliency of Hunts Point, as well as ensuring that the markets continue to employ from the local area and stable jobs that allow them to support their families and have a, a, a even a better quality of life standard. I'll let Council Mampa Salamaga expand upon those successes in a moment, but it should suffice to say that we are planning to build upon the work he is doing in today's hearing in order to obtain a better understanding of how the myriad of funding from city, state, and federal resources is being used to improve and expand the cooperative as Hunt Point. We plan on discussing what ongoing steps the administration is taking in the areas of flood proofing and energy resiliency, how and in what capacity union labor is being employed in the markets, and the challenges the markets are facing with respect to expansion and further infrastructure development. In addition to the Economic Development Corporation, we look forward to hearing testimony today from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Business Integrity Commission, both of which play a vital role at the markets and upon whom we rely to keep the market safe from client change, corruption, respectfully. With that said, I'd like to acknowledge, um, well, we all have Kalamut's uh, coup and Salamanca here. And I'd like to turn over to my fellow uh, council member and basically co-chair today from Land Use, Council Member Rafael Salamanca for his opening words. Thank you, uh, Chair Vallone. I, I really appreciate you uh, putting this, uh, this hearing together. I know I've been asking, um, we've, been at, we've been in conversations about having a hearing together for some time now, and I really wanna thank you for uh, uh, last week uh, doing a tour of the produce market and the meat market. On the coldest day of the year. Uh, on the coldest day of the year. <laughs> um, 
And and so we, it was so cold that we were we went into the refrigerators to cool off. I mean to we warm did. up to warm up. Warmer. Right? It was much warmer. That's probably where um, I lost my tooth. I yeah, that's I uh, <laughs> I, I want to thank. I see there's members from the market here, um, the produce and me, and I really want to thank you for taking out the time and coming down to City Hall uh, for this important hearing. And I want to thank uh, EDC and the other city agencies that are here. Um, the produce markets, the markets, the Huntsman community is ex extremely special to me. Um, not only do I represent it, born and raised in this community, but my dad worked in the produce market for about 18 years. Uh, he was a local 202 member, and that is how my family survived. That's how I was able to get uh, my health care, you know, and, 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 and for myself and my sister and, and my family. Um, I, I know that the market is an economic engine. Um, not just to the South Bronx, but to the city as a whole. Um, they create jobs, and they are also a major food source uh, for uh, the tri-state area. Um, and in this hearing today, I really want to highlight the work that EDC as a landlord does hand-in-hand, hand, not just with the markets, but the different businesses in the Hunts Point community. Um, but I also want to want to have conversations uh, about the, um, the oversight that BIC has in the markets and the overzealousness, well, the complaints of overzealousness that is happening in the markets uh, with BIC, um, not just with the um, not just with the big markets, but also with the mom and pop shops uh, that are there. Um, it's something that I uh, I heard uh, when I before I got elected, and I was a district manager of the local community board, or even before I, I was district manager. Um, these are conversations that I heard when I was a board member at that local community board. Um, I am also interested in hearing in terms of resiliency. Uh, what EDC is doing in terms of resiliency. I know that there's funding that has been allocated. Uh, there are questions why projects have not moved forward. Um, and I also am interested in knowing what are we going to do with the produce market, their lease. Um, there's their, they need a new facility. Um, and as a landlord, EDC being the landlord, you know, um, I want to know what is, is, is the city doing to accommodate them and give, um, give these markets the necessary tools that they need so that they can continue to be that economic engine in the South Bronx. Um, so with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Salamanca. I also see Councilmember Carl Smanchaka snuck in. Welcome, my friend. Uh, I also have to thank my amazing crew. I say they're going to get their own TV show, The Alex and Emily Show, uh, for we handle the largest topics possibly on all our different committee hearings. So thank you to my legislative counsel, Alex Polanoff, my policy analyst, Emily Forgione, our finest analyst, Aliyah Ali, and my crew, Jonathan Shutt and Ahmed Nazar, for being uh, really on top of this hearing. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first panel, and I'd like to uh, swear you in. So please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony to respond honestly to Councilmember Salamanca's questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Please begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Trevelon. Good afternoon, Councilmember Salamanca and members um, of the Economic Development Committee. My name is Cecilia Kushner. I'm the Executive Vice President for Planning at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I'm very pleased to testify before you today on the economic impact of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. I'm joined by my colleague Sabrina Lipman, who is the Vice President of Asset Management, um, and Charlie Samboy, who is the Vice President for Government and Community Relations, both of whom uh, oversee our work in Hunts Point. We also joined by Cheryl Garcia, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Investigation from the New York City Business Integrity uh, Commission. The Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, also known as the FDC, is um, the most important cluster of food sources that is managed by the city. Simply put, Hunts Point feeds the tri-state area. Uh, we estimate that about 4.5 billion pounds of food is distributed through the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center every single year. This volume is then distributed both throughout the five boroughs and into the surrounding tri-state area. And about roughly 50% of the food that passes through the Hunts, through Hunts Point ends up in New York City, while the other half ends up in cities across the East Coast and beyond. The food distribution center is comprised of over 100 public and private wholesalers, distributors, and food manufacturers, including those at the Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market, the Hunts Point Cooperative Meat Market, and the New Fulton Fish Market. Close to 50% of the customers at the FDC are independent restaurants and cafes, where about 20% are bodegas, 18% are supermarkets, and 13% are food markets. And every year, the FDC provides food to more than 23,000 restaurants and engage with over 2,500 greengrocers. 
Together, the FDC is home to nearly 8,400 direct jobs and generates about $2.3 billion in sales annually. Hunts Point has long been an important industrial job center for the city. Previously home to steel mills and power plants, the neighborhood experienced a radical shift in the 1960s as economic trends impacted legal, legal, sorry, legacy industry um, on the peninsula. At that time, the city released a bold plan to create a food distribution center on Hunts Point. The location was well positioned for the movement of goods via different many uh, avenues, including rail, highway, and water. And by locating New York City's primary facilities for meat and produce wholesaler at one full service hub, it became exponentially easier for vendors to purchase all of the food they needed in one single location. So less than a decade later, the Hunts Point Cooperative Market and Hunts Point Terminal Market were born, um, which are known today as the meat market and the produce market. Over the last 50 years, the way in which goods and merchandise has been moved and stored at these facilities has changed significantly. And in his first year in office, Mayor de Blasio committed to ensuring that the food distribution center continues to modernize and committed $150 million to revitalizing the food distribution center through 2026. Um, we're pleased to report that we've spent or allocated nearly $62 million of this funding, which is over, uh, a little over 40% uh, on projects to improve the food distribution center. These include remediating a site, a site known as AOU2, improving and modernizing the meat market, upgrading the fish market, and investing in resiliency measures to protect the region food supply. And when making this investment, we work tirelessly to ensure that we use clean energy and adhere to the most sustainable practices. The balance of the funding allocated by Mayor de Blasio, approximately $88 million, will be used to further expand and redevelop the meat and produce markets and additional area-wide improvements that will benefit all of the businesses in the FDC. In August, we released an RFEI with the support of the Produce Co-op and we're now reviewing response for a full-blown redevelopment. We'd like to thank um, Council Member Salamenka for his leadership in supporting this important initiative, and we, we couldn't be uh, at this moment today if it weren't for his leadership. Uh, we look forward to continuing conversation with our tenants and local stakeholders as we advance um, this 12-year investment strategy. But Hunts Point is far more than the city-owned food distribution center. The peninsula is also home to a broader industrial area that keeps New York running and a vibrant neighborhood with a long and rich history of arts, culture, and advocacy. In 2004, New York City and the Hunts Point community released the first Hunts Point Vision Plan. This comprehensive blueprint for the area includes a roadmap for making the food distribution center more sustainable, helping business thrive, ensuring residents could take part in its prosperity, investing in open space and quality of life, and keeping the peninsula an economic engine to meet the city's evolving needs. The Hunts Point Vision Plan consisted of four major categories, optimizing land use, creating connections, improving traffic and pedestrian safety, and finding new workforce solutions. EDC is proud of the progress that has been made in these four areas. We are advancing or have completed 57 projects, which realize close to 90% of the vision the community called for in 2004. We're grateful for our ongoing collaboration with the community and the Hunts Point Vision Plans Task Force, which include Community Board 2, The Point CDC, Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, and the Hunts Point Economic Development Corporation, among others. The Hunts Point Vision Task Force has met with city agency twice a year for the past 15 years, and we appreciate their ongoing commitment to this collaborative process. Today, more than 10 city agencies are advancing several projects in Hunts Point. The city has made 13 intersections safer for pedestrian and have also built out pedestrian and bike path along Spofford, Hunts Point, and Lafayette Avenues. We created the BX46 bus route, which helps improve connections within the peninsula and with other communities throughout the city. We have also made new truck routes to maximize their efficiency and reduce the env environmental impact on residents, both of which should improve air quality. Also, through um, the Hunts Point Vision Plan, the city has created nearly 14 acres of new waterfront space and improved access to recreational amenities at the Bronx River. With the creation of Barreto Point Park, Hunts Point Riverside Park, Hunts Point Landing, the Heisenhauer Bosch Connector, coupled with completing the Food um, Center Drive Greenway, we have forged a safe link between residential areas of Hunts Point and the neighborhood's parks and have provided waterfront access to the community, which is, um, was decade in the making. 
Further, um, the city is working to expand affordable housing in the area for the redevelopment of Spofford, which is one of um, EDC's proudest projects. The transformational project will convert the former Spofford Juvenile Detention Center into a vibrant, mixed-use development that will bring 740 units of affordable housing, open space, including a new plaza, light industrial business opportunities, community facilities, and ground floor retail to the Hunts Point neighborhood. And lastly, among our most impactful action over the past decade and a half, we have dramatically increased the number of employment opportunities available to residents, while at the same time creating a robust talent pipeline to the market's family supporting jobs. Over the past two decades, unemployment rates on the peninsula has dropped by over 50%. However, we recognize that there is still work that needs to be done to support inclusive economic development in the neighborhood. This includes expanding local resident access to industrial jobs, further improving access to the waterfront, and making air quality far better than it is today. <clears throat> and we look forward to building on our previous success and continuing to partner with the City Council to achieve these important goals. We're delighted that community leaders have invited us back to revisit the Hunts Point Vision Plan and engage in a process to define our shared priorities for the next 10 to 15 years in Hunts Point. The Hunts Point Peninsula continues to be both a thriving neighborhood and an invaluable resource to the city. EDC is proud and excited about its work at the Food Distribution Center and the neighborhood at large. Since the initial release of the Hunts Point Vision Plan in 2004, the city and the community have planned for additional major projects that set up the neighborhood for a successful future. All of these will protect the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center as a cluster for commerce and job, and ensure that local residents continue to benefit from the presence of this concentration of markets and food manufacturers. Thank you so much for your attention, for the opportunity to um, talk about Hans Point today, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. <coughs> Anyone else testify? No. no. Uh, so thank you, Cecilia. Uh, a lot there, and a lot to go over. So just going over your testimony, there's a few things in there I just wanted you to maybe further expand upon. So. The Hunts Point vision plan was in 2004. That's correct. So are we envisioning a new vision plan, or what are we, we're 15 years later, so when are we going to update on, or what are the next steps for that? Yeah, plan? so absolutely. The vision plan, uh, when it was done in 2004, uh, is really a kind of a consensus plan between the community and the city on a set of recommendation and priorities. Um, so over the last 15 years, what we've done is work hard to implement and actually make progress on this commitment. So there were 63 projects that were part of the 2004 uh, Hunts Point vision plan, and 97, 90%, or about 57 of them are currently completed or on the way. So with the $150 million that was allocated by the administration at the beginning, is that also coordinated within the vision plan? So some elements of the vision plan, including improvement in the food distribution center, but the vision plan really goes beyond the food distribution center to look at the entirety of the Hunts Point Peninsula, including the manufacturing area outside of the food distribution center, as well as the residential area. So who's on the board and when does it meet? Of this um, do you want to? So it was comprised of a task force that was organized uh, in 2004, which included the community board, uh, the Point CDC, the Hunts Point Economic Development Corporation, quite a number of the businesses inside the food distribution center, um, the office of the council member at that time, and a number of other electeds, uh, borough president's office, assembly member. So it's a, there's about, I would say, over 40 organizations that were represented at that time. And what we do now is we have uh, every six months we hold a meeting in the community. Um, we invite task force members as well as residents um, to participate in receiving updates. Um, we Is that biannually? When does that happen? Yes, that happens uh, bi on a biannual basis. Is there a report that's generated from that? Yeah, so after the meeting, we email and, and provide um, copies to folks as, as at will, um, the report that comes from that exercise. So we provide an update on the projects, um, and we provide that with the council member as well. And then going back to your, your very first question, so it's been 15 years, most of the recommendation have actually been implemented. So together with members of this task force and the community board and council member Salamanca, um, we all discussed kind of updating the vision plan. So re renewing the process of coming together with the community to develop new recommendation and kind of setting up a vision and a framework for the next 10 to 15 years of investment and planning in this community. And so we will be hiring kind of a third party facilitator and um, starting in the first quarter of next year, uh, we hope to begin this process, and we're really excited about it. Well, we definitely like to be a partner in that, so we'd like yeah, to be absolutely. included to make sure that what we talk about today and what we talk about going forward, yep. we can we can join efforts on that. I mean, you started by saying that the 
the FTC is comprised over 100 public and private wholesalers. Can you kind of break down what the balance and the percentage is? Sh- sure. Uh, I mean, so the, the the three largest kind of um, tenants that you have, the food distribution center, are um, the produce uh, market, um, the meat market, and um, the fish market. And I'll let Sabrina talk about, like, how many businesses as part of those. But these are, like, the largest cooperative um, that make up, like, the vast majority of the businesses. And then there are individual businesses outside of the co-ops. So with the three co-ops, for those that are listening, we have the meat market, the fish market, and the mm-hmm. produce market. So how yeah. much of the percentage would you say do those three co-ops have of the occupied versus private businesses that are separate? Yeah. Okay. Hi, council member. Nice to see you again. So uh, the produce market, who's here today, has about 30 cooperators uh, that make up the market itself. Uh, The meat market has about 42 shareholders. um, And then the fish market has about 27 businesses. So the three public wholesale markets make up the the, uh, good majority of the businesses that are in the FTC. And and how many private businesses are there after that? And then after that, you have uh, Dairyland or Chef's Warehouse as an individual business, Baldor, uh, Crasdale that's been there since the inception since 69, Anheuser-Busch, Sultana, and Citarella. And those are all negotiated separately and on their own? Correct. All all of the businesses. By the way, we have a little um, distribution <coughs> kind of map with some of the overlay that EDC did for us. So if anyone wants a copy, uh, we can make some extra copies of these. Um, so on that percentage breakdown, how much of the land at Hunts Point is is city owned, state owned, or anything still left federal, or is it all 100% in our possession? So the entirety of the food distribution center is city owned. So do we have any joint projects combined with the state? economic development as well as city EDC, because under my understanding, there's still some joint projects going on. Yeah, so I think each time there is a project that is a large project or at scale, for example, the redevelopment of the produce market, like we look to partnership with the state, mainly because um, these projects are one where we need to leverage all fundings. So we look to partnership with our state um, counterparts and also our federal counterparts to be able to like build the, and fund the best projects that we can. But the so land can you give us an example of one of those joint projects? So, for example, the um, the RFEI that we just put for the produce market, like all of the conversation about coming together um, with uh, uh, an RFEI and agreeing on consensus for the redevelopment of the produce market was done um, in uh, was done in collaboration with the state and in collaboration uh, with the produce co-op. How is that work with EDC as a landlord? versus the relationship of state funding, who has final say then? I think the way we try to do the, these are really kind of like large scale generational projects. And so the state. Well, that's the, the, the task of today's hearing is trying yeah. to tackle that there is so much. So I don't plan on tackling every aspect yeah, because yeah. it's impossible. But but there hasn't been a hearing in some time. So w- w- give us some of that perspective of that interagency cooperation between you and the state? Yeah, I think the way we kind of look at it is really one of um, that's centered around value. As I said, the food distribution center is the most critical food supply center for New York City. So that is a really important, um, uh, it's a critical place for the state as well. And so they, like us, want to make sure that the food distribution center remains affordable, remains stable, allow for job growth. And they, like us, have relationship with um, all of the tenants because many of them have been there for a long time as well. All right, so for example, if you have an issue of something like Sandy or a magnitude or a resiliency mm-hmm. question, mm-hmm. you're going to have federal, state, and local input and different avenues for resources mm-hmm. and for um, protecting for the future against. Mm-hmm. So how, how is that done? Yeah. I mean, so for resiliency, it's slightly different in the sense that, like, the federal government really only acts post-climate um, disaster. So there's not really, like, a lot of federal dollars that are available post um, disaster, but like post Sandy, um, this community and the food distribution center came together with the city to uh, put an application to HUD, the federal agency that was responsible for post Sandy dollars, uh, and we received twenty million dollars in in federal funding for a particular project, which was to really kind of look at both um, 
protecting the food distribution center and, and specific areas of uh, the residential community. Then what the city did is kind of leverage that funding to put more of its capital to actually develop a full-blown comprehensive kind of energy project. Um, for is that separate from the $150 million with the that, RFI, um, or is so that... Portion, or, yeah, so t about 26 million out of the 150 um, are um, g going towards that project. And is that project going to enhance or enc encapsulate all of the different cooperatives, or is it just certain section of Hunts Point? Um, so this particular project, and I let kind of Sabrina and Charlie answer if there's like particular um, uh, more detailed technical questions on it, is really geared towards um, backup generation or backup energy, uh, the produce and meat. In, in your uh, remarks, you said, for example, that the meat market um, was uh, without power for 40, 36 hours. That can happen in the event of a flood. That can also happen if there's a con ed, you know, uh, breakdown or if like there's a... Well, how do we make wave. sure that doesn't happen? Because it's clear to me that that yeah. can't happen. So that's what are right. we doing So the sure? way you, I mean, rather than like, it, it's really hard to make sure it doesn't happen. Like what we do is we make sure that in the event that it happens, um, the produce and meat markets still have electricity. So what we're building is kind of a microgrid, which is its own source of power that will be able for 36 hours to give power to the produce and meat market so that in the event that electricity through the regular Con Ed grid is not available, um, these two kind of very essential and critical facility for food supply in New York City do not lose their Produce. When will that be completed? Um, so, do you want to talk about like where we are on? Yeah, or sure. So where we are today is um, there's a site next to Crasso that's being remediated um, to place this infrastructure um, there. That infrastructure would support three sources of energy to two of the markets. The produce market would get cooling uh, as well as electricity to take a portion of their electrified trucks um, to electrify a portion of their trucks and the meat market would get hot water for their boilers. Um, what that does is we're using natural gas to, fu to fuel this system, and the idea being that it can get off of Con Ed's grid if it has to, and be able to provide those three sources of energy for those two markets. Um, for the other tenants, a number of their working floor is above the floodplain, so in the event of, uh, of a flood were to come in, a lot of their goods are not at risk of being destroyed, but we are working um, to secure that the energy source for those buildings continues to operate. And what would be a timeline? So the microgrid, we are beginning remediation uh, this quarter. If nothing goes, I mean, we're going to do the remediation process, so I mean that there are no um, hiccups in that process. So the site's still going through remediation process? It began remediation now. This, this quarter is beginning remediation. Um, and we anticipate it will be done by 2022. All right, so what's our plan between now and 2022? Is there any backup plan with Con Ed or anything else? So one of the things we've worked out with the meat market is they have uh, HESCO barriers that protect uh, their energy source. Um, and we are also working um, with the council member's support through a $3.5 million um, resume allocation. We are advancing the uh, generators that are going to the meat market, and we anticipate that those will be installed and operational in the spring of 2020. And that'll provide them the ability to also get off of Con Ed's grid for the meat market. And that would be a temporary until the 2022 estimate? No, this is this going forward, those generators will be available to them uh, on an ongoing basis should they need it for emergency purposes. So you mentioned the site being remediated. How many are how many remaining undeveloped sites there are at Hunts Point for future use? There's one site that was recently finished remediating. It's a site that's adjacent to the meat market at which we colloquially call AOU2, and that is one of the last few remaining undeveloped sites um, in Hunts Point, in, in the food distribution center that we control. That's the last one? There's nothing else that we can look at besides that lot for future use? So all the other lots that are currently vacant are, are accounted for for future projects. What breakdown do we have of the future use of those projects, I don't. So I don't one know. one of them, and I'll in, in the event my colleagues can jump in. So site D is the one we're talking to with respect to where the um, microgrid is going. That's next to Crasdale, adjacent to the meat market. You have AOU two, which we are in discussions um, with the meat market about their expansion there. Um, we also have a site that's currently vacant, but that is we are in lease negotiations with uh, an organization called Grow NYC, um, and there's also another site. Um, which we've long-term been um, working towards activating an alternative fuel station. Um, so those four or five sites are the remaining 
currently vacant sites, but um, those sites all have um, anticipated plans for each of them. So are those sites separately budgeted for in the largest scale with EDC, or are they part of the $150 million future growth of capital and infrastructure at the project? How How is the breakdown <laughs> of the funding handled between the separate cooperatives, mm -hmm. the independent sites, and how would I know how that's, if it's being divided equally or sh how it's shared? Thank you, council member, for that question. So of the $150 million I always know it's a good question when we follow <laughs> up with thank you for that question. <laughs> So of the $150 million Cecilia mentioned, uh, we are happy that we've committed 40% of that. In terms of the remaining uh, $88 million, uh, we do have really exciting plans for it. Uh, primarily, I would say, uh, our friends are here, the produce market. Um, we will work closely with all of the markets to identify the priority projects for the remaining funding, um, but we do anticipate working closely with the produce market and their redevelopment um, to understand what allocation would need to go to that redevelopment. So that was a good answer for generalities. But I'm looking for is how, besides the $150 million, how is the budget for the individual sites on Hunts Point allocated? So is it just individually treated per co-op, per site, per land, per private? Or is there an overview budget for all of Hunts Point? No, I, I think like the way we try to um, uh, to look at it is is several ways. The first one is like we try to leverage the city funding. So, for example, the twenty million you know uh, uh, that we got from the federal government for the microgrid, we added to it to make it a fuller project that is fully funded that will happen on site D. Um, and then we are like in constant conversation with all of but the that tenants. grid is not for everyone, no, right? That you grid is not for everyone. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, and then with with the respect of the rest of the funding and all the different facilities, um, each market or each individual business have their own kind of expansion plan or vision for what is needed. Um, there is what the city can do. These tenants really often, most of the time, own their own building. And so we're looking also for them often to provide some level of funding to be able to help uh, with improvements to their building. Um, we sometimes look at um, grants and sometimes where like for example we received like over time a lot of tiger grants for rail <laughs> for rail improvements on the site so we really look to the the 150 as like the first part to help us define projects that do make sense and that we take on as they come and as they take priority and in collaboration and in kind of negotiation with each of the tenants so you mentioned the rail project are there any projects that the city since EDC is the ultimate landlord, mm -hmm. is there any projects that the city will envision that will infect the entire site that you would have negotiations with all of your tenants on the site, like a rail site? Is there yeah. anything else like that coming up in the future? Yeah, I mean, like one of the things we're, we're working on right now and we're really excited um, is uh, the development of a, a marine barge terminal. So um, what, what e where EDC can really add value to all the tenants is investment in infrastructure. Um, today, most of the distribution in New York City is done by trucks. Uh, and part of our freight plan, which is an EDC plan, which is a 10-year, $100 million plan by this administration, is to make sure um, that we begin to uh, get some of our goods and distribution shifted to rail um, and shifted to barging. And so we are looking for the first time to actually have a barge terminal, which would allow uh, private barging companies to be able to bring directly goods, either trucks on barge or actually cargo on barge, um, to be able to come to the Hunts Point Terminal market. And that could serve any of the tenants that are there. Well, that's um, exciting news, because that for all the other, as council members, we're always besieged by uh, commercial truck traffic right. and local pollution and right. congestion in the neighborhood That's this right. would be a way do you have an idea on when that possible marine may happen sure so we released an RFP um, late in the spring we received responses we're looking at them we're positive about the type of responses we're getting um, associated with this project the city has committed 25 million dollar out of this freight NYC 100 million dollar pot so for example that's 25 million dollar that is not part of the 150 right so that's a that's a but perfect so example of like, a source you know, of funding separate that's right that's right so we continue to look at the connection between policy goals and the food distribution center as we seek funding. So there's a lot, and I and we've been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers, and who's now no longer here, but see, I missed <laughs> him. He was here and he's gone. Uh, I'd like to get to my other council members. Let me let me just wrap up the first part of. You have the meat market, the fish market, and the produce market. So you have 
two leases, I guess, that have been successfully uh, renewed. One in the meat market is good all the way to 2058, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. The fish market is good through 2054. Mm -hmm. And the produce market, I believe, um, has a option to renew in 2021. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That is correct. So I guess there's negotiations going on now with that. Um, with each one of them, there, so they're individually as a co-op. So it's a little bit difficult now I'm putting my legal hat on. So if you're a co-op, your financing options are also limited and different and more difficult as opposed to owning your own building. Is there anything that is universally can be applied to the three markets for financing options that EDC could provide to help in infrastructure going forward? Or are they left to their own financing abilities to take care of their own infrastructure concerns? Yeah, so I think our goal at the Food Distribution Center is always to make sure um, uh, that we can provide kind of affordable rent and long-term stability for the businesses, but also for the food supply at large. Um, so we have kind of long tradition of working with the co-op mo model because it's a model that came with the creation of the food distribution center. Um, uh, with respect to produce, because we're engaging and beginning to enter into um, kind of a large redevelopment project, we really want to think about kind of um, uh, Kind of leasing renewal and the terms of uh, of any kind of business deal in relationship to the redevelopment itself. So the two kind of actually are speaking to each other, which is uh, right planning. And we always look to um, kind of be fair. Our goal is to make sure that tenants have long-term stability um, and that they can stay in the food distribution center and continue to grow and create jobs. Like that is our most important goal. This is what EDC is the landlord of the food distribution center. And so we'll continue to do that with each of the tenants. I well, I mean, Council Member Salamanca was, was quick to show me the direct impact for local jobs in the Bronx and in his district and a huge impact and over 8,400 direct jobs and how many of them are citywide jobs and great career building opportunities. Yeah. So we want to make sure we do everything we can yeah. to protect these three co-ops and grow. So we'll always be on the side and trying to enhance and protect and look at that. And I think, uh, and I'll turn over to Councilmember Salamanca, but one of the things we need to discuss is providing that infrastructural support mm -hmm. to take the next generational approach there at Hunts Point. Because clearly the, we are not maximizing square footage usage. Mm -hmm. We're using temporary trailers yep. for storage and diesel that's spilling over into the neighborhood. Once once you walk through, you can see the, the co-ops and the tenants are, are maximizing every inch of what they have, but not to the capacity I'm looking at saying, why aren't we just building a structure yep. that maximizes the two, three stories instead of just having a truck in the back spilling diesel yep. fuel. And they're saying, well, we do what we can to survive until we can get a new lease. Yep. Um, to me, that we're not maximizing our potential. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you. I think we would completely agree um, with uh, uh, with this statement. Um, part of what is happening in the food distribution center is businesses have been very successful and it is growing and in some cases like the produce market kind of bursting at the seams um, so as part of the redevelopment effort it's modernizing the facility but it's also looking at like um, generational growth like how do we expect this particular cooperative and this particular market to grow over the next 20 to 30 years and how can we develop facilities um, that are meeting uh, the needs of the tenants and the needs of the city as we continue to grow as a city as well so this is definitely kind of in line with our thinking here Thank you. With that, the panels will come after EDC, and then Councilmember Salamanca is going to have his questions, and then we have Councilmember Ku, and then uh, Councilmember Menchaca if they'd like to ask some questions. Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Alone. So before I start, I just you know these meetings are transmitted live, and so the Hunts Point Vision Plan Task Force they're watching live and they're sending me text messages uh, on questions I should ask. And so the first question that they want to know, and then I'll go to my line of questioning, is just to piggyback on the chair's question. Um, the vacant lots that we have here, the contaminated lot, uh, land, mm -hmm. Site D, when did you decide to remediate that site? Because we are unaware of that. So that site has been planned for quite some time. Um, actually, one of our colleagues, Tracy Bell, she attends community board meetings at the request of the, of the district manager, and I believe this year alone, she's been there twice. Um, so after we finished AOU2, which I believe was completed at the beginning of this year, we then moved to Site D. So we've been in communication with the community board about the remediation of Site D. But they D. just texted me and they said they know nothing about it. I, I would disagree with that statement. That we, All right, we, I'm just telling you that they're, they're live, they're watching live. Yeah. But we, we've yeah. been in touch with the, with the district manager 
about upcoming remediation and when it starts, we would send them a note as well. All right, because I, I was unaware that there was remediation. I, my understanding was that that site was still being tested. No, oh. so that, that yeah. site's been tested over the last year or two. Um, we were examining different types of remediation models. In the previous iterations of remediation, we would actually extract the contaminated soil from the ground and ship it out. Um, recent um, different types of science has, has led us to a new and tested method that actually um, solidifies that waste in place and allows us to place a cap around it um, so that we don't actually have to truck out those that, that contaminated waste. And that is what we did at AOU2, and that's what we will be doing at Site D. Yeah, and I would just add, like, we're happy um, we're happy to come back to the community or the task force anytime to give like a full view of it. As uh, as um, Charlie said, like the, the approach around remediation is kind of multi-step process. The first one is doing testing to define kind of like the level of contaminants, the depth of contaminants, and then define a protocol, the Department of Health um, and DEC, which is like a, the state control agency on all remediation protocol. And once we've defined what is the best way to do it, then we begin to mobilize. We haven't mobilized yet on site D we're gonna be doing it like in the coming weeks so please notify the community board because sure. they are unaware of that. your plans for this site um, and in terms of site D uh, is there going to be any coastal protection uh, um, for this site because it, it is my understanding that this site uh, is prone to flooding <laughs> Yeah, so as, as part of the um, microgrid project that will be going on Site D, that will be elevated well above the floodplain. So there will be a structure on which this microgrid will sit, and that structure will ensure that the microgrid itself is above the floodplain. All right, thank you. All right, so let me go back now to my line of questionings that I have here. How many businesses uh, does currently has leases with EDC? Is it is it only nine in the Hunts Point community? Is it... On, is it only the yep. nine businesses yep, yep. that you have here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you are only focused in the full center drive area. You're, you don't have any other property outside of this area in the Hunts Point Peninsula. No. I mean, we have Spofford. Oh, yeah, Spofford. But this is yeah. our only industrial is property. Industrial. Okay. Um, um, these are, what type of leases do you give the markets, like the produce market, the fish market? Um, um, do you give them a triple net lease? Well, what type of lease do you provide them with? Nice to meet you, Councilmember Salamanca. We haven't met yet. Um, so it's determinant on, based on each market. So we, we match the needs of the market. The majority are ground leases. Um, the fish market is the only one that has recently changed over as EDC has taken on uh, the responsibility of the maintenance and operations. Uh, but it, it, you know, we speak with the markets and understand what their needs are. And uh, the meat market is an example. We help with their capital reserves and allocate that, and that goes through us. Uh, but the majority are all ground leases. So the roof collapses in produce or meat market or fish market. Who's responsible for fixing it? So it's depending on the lease. So the fish market, that would be us um, because we oversee and they we oversee now the maintenance and operations. Uh, the produce market, we if the roof collapses, it's all hands on deck for all of us. Um, but the produce market, you know, that's why we're redeveloping it. Um, and then the meat market would be, I mean, it's all in collaboration, but the lease stipulates who would be responsible for it. All right, so the produce market it's both the produce and EDC who's responsible. So you split the bill. The I mean, I think it, it. No, it's no, it's not. Um, it's a it's a triple net lease. It's a triple net lease. So they're, they're responsible. So the bill goes to them uh, to fix the roof. All right. Um, and then I see here that you gave us a list of the lease expirations. I just mm -hmm. want to be clear. So the produce market, they have an option to stay there till 2031, right? With the extensions, but their lease ring, their lease expires on 2021. Correct. Correct? Okay. And you are going through your negotiations now, correct? Correct. All right. We met with the produce market last two weeks ago or last week. Last okay. week. Good. And where are we with the RFEI? Is there any information that you can divulge or are you still going looking at? We received the, the information I can divulge is we received responses on November 1st. We are reviewing those responses. We have committed to the produce market that we will be giving them a blind briefing because this is in partnership with them um, to review what we've received. Okay. So you will do that when? In the next two weeks. 
All right. That's what we've promised. All right. Um, I see here Anheuser-Busch. I don't know if this is a typo. Their lease expires in 2105. Mm-hmm. That is not a typo. That is the expert. How did they ne- get to negotiate that? It's. A, I mean, we yeah. always strive for <laughs> for long-term leases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we always strive for long-term leases. Uh, this is including options, so I just want to stipulate that. So uh, there are. They would have to extend. They. They are uh, expirations that come up well before that. So these obviously. are options. These now, are including um, options. You, uh, th- what you charge per square footage is it consistent? through all of your leases or it depends on the business it's very dependent on the business okay so it's not it's not so what are you what are you determining what you're going to charge the produce market compared to the fish and the meat market for yeah. square footage no that's a good question so i mean as you know and as i know you are very passionate about we are 100 percent committed to ensuring the food stability um, of new york city and that requires us to ensure we have a strong and stable fdc um, the markets in particular uh, we work very closely with them to ensure that they have a very stable and well well below market rent yes. um, to make sure and ensure their stability and, and to make sure they're able to be um, competitive and, and offer offer good pricing for New Yorkers. Um, other organizations or other companies that are able to uh, play clo- pay closer to a, a market rent, um, those are all negotiations that happen with each of those tenants. All right. Um, BIC. Uh, BIC occupies space in the markets. Do they? We would, I, I do not have the answer to that question. I've seen a trailer at the fish market. Is yeah. someone here from Bic? Yes. yes. We can bring Cheryl up. Sure, we can we can bring up Bic now so we can keep the hearing going. Just state your name for the record and Cheryl Garcia. Thank you, Cheryl. We'll make some room for you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth and answer the questions of the council member truthfully? Great, and we're just going to get you, maybe share a mic with Charlie there. Yeah, Yeah, the mic, yeah, yes. (coughs) Thank you. Um, May may I have your title? Deputy Commissioner of Investigations. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for coming. Um, Commissioner, do you, uh, does, does, uh, and I'm going to jump back and forth. My question was for, I guess, EDC. Do, Do you occupy space, physical space in the markets? Uh, as you said, we do have a trailer yes. outside the fish market. It's okay. up against the back of the building. Yeah, I saw that. Are, and you don't, you, you do not occupy space in any any other location in the market. I mean, that's your headquarters in, in Hunts Point. That trailer. Yes, it's really a temporary yes. location, and so um, DCAS has given us a new location in the Bronx. Okay. Um, so I don't know. It'll be a couple of months before that process is completed, and then we'll be moving out of the fish market space. All right. Cool. All right. Um, and you you do not pay. Uh, for that space. Do you pay rent? Does DCAS charge you rent on your budget for that space? I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm guessing we probably do. I think we do, yes. I don't know how much it is, though. All right. Um, All right, and just to go back to EDC, and then I'm going to go back to um, to BIC. Um, Is there language, and this is a question that... that, um, uh, I'm constantly getting asked, you know, uh, the produce, the markets, you know, they're a big economic engine. Um, is there language in the lease ag- in the lease agreements that businesses must uh, give back to the immediate community, such as an example, job fairs, um, um, donating uh, food that will expire soon to the, the local mm-hmm. food pantries? Um, I know that there are many food pantries that mm-hmm. that go to the markets. Um, uh, you no know, food bank, for example, mm-hmm. right? They they get they get mm-hmm. uh, produce from the food market. Um, just this past a weekend, the produce market gave out 1,700 bags of fresh produce mm-hmm. in the Hunts Point community, which was awesome. Thank you very much. I see Myra Gordon. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this weekend, Baldor's is going to provide um, over 600 boxes uh, of food for families of four mm-hmm. for the Hunts Point community. You know, kind of like giving back. Is, is, is it something that um, it's part of the lease that you require them to do this, or this is just something that they are doing because they want to be good neighbors? So I, w- I would say I think these are all laudable goals that we think are important and, and should continue to happen, but those are operate sort of a little bit beyond the scope of our lease. Um, with respect to your question on job fairs and, and, and job um, connecting residents to jobs, what we were able to do successfully in the 
in the extension of Baldor's lease was include a provision where they had to adhere to higher NYC um, provisions. And as part of that, as I, I believe you participated in some of their job fairs, uh, and they have a requirement to, to the 350 jobs that they projected in growing as part of their expansion has to participate and be um, complied with uh, with the higher NYC program, which we monitor. And then just for clarity here, on this uh, report you gave us, you, you said um, it states that there are 8,385 jobs. Is that accurate or is that jobs that will be created in a certain time frame? So those are, those are the number of jobs that we have gotten information from our tenants. That, Th that they, are that So are, there's a body for each one of these jobs. So we are told through our tenants that the produce market has approximately 3,000 jobs. The meat market has about 2,300 um, the fish market has about 750, um, and Baldor's um, today, ha their, their former facility before it was expanded, had about 750 jobs, and as part of the 100,000 square foot expansion, um, they're looking at a, a growth of another 350. Um, so when we take all of those, and, and that's but not the, even the growth, are those jobs currently exist, or these are just positions that they're they're looking to hire? The 350 will be the what they are projecting when they are done with their expansion and the, and the full growth of that, that 100,000 square foot facility. Look, I, because I just want to get accurate information. So this 8,385, is, is, these are not, you also have projected jobs as part of this number. So the, 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 that number does not include the 350. So if you want to back out the 350, it's approximately 8,100 jobs. Okay, all right. I'll leave that. Um, what programs are in place for local hiring and how is it tracked? So as I mentioned, the Baldor's lease, we were able to, as part of the extension, incorporate Hire NYC. Yeah. As of right this moment, I do not know that any other of our, of our, any other of our leases have Hire NYC provisions. Um, we work very closely with um, the markets. As you know and mentioned, um, your dad was a, a member of Teamsters, and we work uh, and are looking to work with them very closely. Um, we think there's tremendous opportunity to continue to employ local residents, and we'd be happy to to work with you, the produce market, and the, and the rest of the, the unions that are represented there to ensure that a greater percentage of residents um, are employed. That said, I will say that a, a great majority of the, of, the, of the employees that are there today are already local Bronx residents. So we know that 70% or so are of the produce market um, employees are Bronx residents, about 65 percent of the employees at the meat market are Bronx residents and 25 percent of those at the fish market are also Bronx residents all right um, the the barge is adjacent to the fish market mm -hmm. and I, I'm pretty sure you know we uh, there's the plan is to shut down the barge the mayor's plans at 10-year plan at the end of 2026 um, you know I would like to see it shut down while he's still mayor said this publicly could bring back the message to him, please. Um, but are there plans now that we know that in 10 years from now that barge will be shut down? Are there plans? Is EDC having internal conversations within yourselves or with the mayor's office as to what the city's plans are with that piece of, of, of land there? So we, we don't have um, – that's, that's an interesting point. So um, it's important to note that while the that – portion of land is sort of within the food distribution center. It is not within the jurisdiction of the EDC. So that is within the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections. Um, as you stated, the goal is to, to close that by 2026. We believe, um, and we hope that you agree, that working together as part of the upcoming um, vision plan exercise to determine what the next 15 to 20 years of Hunts Point could look like, we think that this could be a tremendous opportunity to collaborate with the community, with your office and others to determine what that could look like. Ultimately, that's not up to EDC. As, as I stated, that is in the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections, but we'd be happy to work with you and our, and our colleagues at other sister agencies to determine what that could look like in the future. When it's handed over from Department of Corrections, will it wind up with EDC? That is not, we do not know. Yeah. That's probably what's going to happen. I mean, if corrections is moving away from it, it's probably going to wind up. So the, the, the sort of the, the hierarchy of, of, the, of that would land with the first deputy mayor. So, um, that and is with the council. That's right. Don't mess with the yeah, land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the council. Um, I just want to make sure that the community board, the local community mm -hmm. and the community board and the residents are mm -hmm. sitting in the table mm -hmm. deciding what's going to happen with that land. We don't want a city to come and say, this is what we're going to do. Absolutely. You know, it, um, that's not community engagement. Uh, Fright NYC, um, you put out an RFP or an RFEI? An RFP. RFP. Uh, how many responses did you get back? We got... Um uh, several responses, more than five. Okay. Yeah. And just, I, I know, 
uh, there's limited information you can give me because I guess you're 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 Open you're deciding how mm-hmm. to move forward. Yeah. Um, had have you have you decided on what location you're planning on bringing this? No, site? the the respond so um. One one of the sites that people could respond for was part of the food distribution center, but respondent could also offer any private sites uh, within the IBZ along the shoreline. And so the responses we received um, are on both some private sites and some in the food distribution center, and we're looking at all of them at the same time. Okay. All right. Um, and my concern, I mean, mm-hmm. look, right, NYC, the way is being rolled mm-hmm. out to eliminate the amount of truck traffic mm-hmm. coming into the Huntsman mm-hmm. community as an asthmatic mm-hmm. is, is music to my ears. Mm-hmm. Um, but my w- a concern that I have is that whatever gets barged in, mm-hmm. it's not just for the, the markets. It will be for other businesses mm-hmm. outside of the markets. I, I just don't want to see an increase in truck traffic mm-hmm. of deliveries coming in to pick up and, 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 and to take outside of the uh, yeah. of the Hunts Point market. Yeah, we market. understand that. All right. Um, all right. I just have a few questions for, for Bic, if possible. Um, how many, Commissioner, how many businesses are under the Bic's catchment area um, in the Hunts Point Peninsula? So uh, um, Bic's catchment area is the cooperative meat market, the Hunts Point produce market, the fish market, and then the area that's adjacent to the produce market. Um, and in total, there are a little bit over 200 businesses that are registered with us in those four segments. All right. And how many businesses that are within that catchment area are not on the big jurisdiction? I don't know the number, but I think it would only be a few of the businesses in the adjacent area. There are some sort of like retail businesses, I believe, in the adjacent area, like maybe a small bakery or things like that that are not doing wholesale business. And so there's no food wholesale businesses that are not under your jurisdiction? I don't believe so. I mean, the businesses that are, uh, the businesses such as Baldor and, you know, Crasdale Foods and Citarella and Anheuser-Busch, those are not under our jurisdiction. Okay. And why? What separates them from the markets? Um, I don't think they're public wholesale markets in the same term or definition, and I think that they've never been under uh, BICS jurisdiction. And, and by, by no way am I trying to get them on the BICS jurisdiction. You know, I'm just, <laughs> uh, just trying to ask these, these questions mm-hmm. because I'm asked these questions as I tour, as I visit Hunts Point, and I, I really don't have an answer why certain businesses are on the big jurisdictions and why some are not. And I believe in your mission, by the way. I believe that you need to exist. The whole point of rooting out organized crime, mm-hmm. I think you did that extremely well. I remember being a kid and my dad telling me the stories of how they came in and they were cleaning up the markets, you know. Um, and so I, I do believe in your in, in, in your vision, but I, I also believe that there should be fairness, you know. And one of the main complaints that I get uh, from BIC is your fees. Um, what do you charge every business? To, um, because they're under your, that are under your jurisdiction. Uh, what fees do you charge them? It's $4,000 to register. So it's four, and, is it, and they, they're mandated to register. Yes. Yes. Um, who determines if a business it falls under your jurisdiction or does not fall under your jurisdiction? Is it BIC? Is it the city? Is it the mayor? Is it the lease negotiation? How, how is that determined? Well, I don't know precisely, but I would say that any wholesale business, and there's also other market businesses within the confines of those four markets, like trucking companies, and they also fall fall under BICS regulation. Okay. So pretty much everything in those four locations other than a small, um, like retail, someone that's selling coffee or... But how did these wholesale businesses... Is it the city that determines if they're going to be on the big um, jurisdiction? Who, who determines that? That's what I want, I want to get to, to the bottom of. Um, I believe that's in the, um, the charter. It's in the city charter, and then it follows through, and it's in the uh, administrative code and the rules of the city of New York. So I'm, not, I'm still not. Um, so the city... The, Wait, no, he, the charter says that Bick is going to oversee Hunts Point? No, that doesn't... Yeah, local markets, wholesale public wholesale markets. 
Well, Hunts Point came under BIC's jurisdiction like in 2002. We assumed responsibility for those markets. And then that adjacent area that I spoke about uh, that's next to the produce market, that came under BIC's jurisdiction in like 2009. That was added. Okay. So a new business comes in um, next to the produce market, or let's say a new business comes into site F, right, whenever they remediate that site, and uh, it's a wholesale. Um, EDC doesn't decide, or the mayor doesn't decide if they fall under your jurisdiction or not. They're automatically under your jurisdiction. I believe so. So I'm still not understanding how these other businesses are not under your jurisdiction. Um, maybe clarify for me, if you could, what, like what, what type of business are you talking so about? Like Baldor's? Uh, you, know, Bal you said Baldor's, Crasdale, uh, Anheuser-Busch, right? They're not under your jurisdiction. I mean, they may have had um, their situations you know, already in place when we took over. I know there was some litigation, like in 2007, yeah. and over Baldor's, so there were some issues there. Um, but it's remained the same since that time. Okay. All right. I'll move on. Um, uh, your fees is the biggest topic of conversation in Hunts Point. $4,000 per business. So you are either you can either be a mom-and-pop shop and you're paying four grand a month, or you can be a big business um, in, 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 in any of the markets and you're still paying $4,000 a month. A business in Hunts Point can be generating $50 million a year, a, a mom and pop shop can be doing half a million dollars a year. Why isn't there kind of a sliding fee scale for uh, a mom and pop shop compared to a big business in Hunts Point? Well, the fees are set through an analysis uh, conducted in conjunction with OMB. Um, they're, they cover the associated costs with processing the application, vetting it, and including um, background investigation. So many of the steps that have to be completed are really the same regardless of the size of the company. Yeah, and I understand that there, there's background. So every two years, you are uh, a new business is submitting a new app, uh, a renewal application? In the fish market, it's every two years, and in the other markets, it's every three years. Okay, all right. All right, so only the fish, the fish market is required to do this every two years. Now, there are other fees. Um, employees. Each employee has to have a, I guess, an I identification card with BIC. Is, is that correct? Uh, BIC, con BIC issues the IDs yes. in the fish market. Um, by the way, we've been joined by council members Joe and I and Lander. Go ahead. In the other markets, those are done actually by, by the markets themselves through the co-ops. So the, so I, I mean, uh, um, a business in in a co-op, they. They give them their own BIC ID, and they have, but they have to submit an application to you and say, "Hey, this is this is a list of my employees." They have to disclose their employees. Yes. I believe it's after ten days once they join the okay. uh, company. And, and there's a fee per employee, right? For that ID. For, the, for that ID. Yes. How much is that fee? I believe it's two hundred dollars. It went up to two hundred dollars. Well, I could I I'd have to double check on that and see. And who's responsible to pay that fee? The employee or the the business? I believe it's the business. And does the business charge I guess I'll ask the business when they come up. Do they, <laughs> they charge the employees for that fee or do they just pick up the tab? Uh, I don't know the answer. Okay, that's fine. Um, if you can get closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you uh, explain so now that Bic has really, you know, done its job, you know, cleared out organized crime I still believe you you need to exist there uh, what what is the what is big's role what, what does what does a big officer uh, business integrity commission officer do uh, in, in, in the market what what are they doing like today well, what, you, what is your officer doing in in, in, in the market um, well as ter in terms of our on-site presence so we have a staff of market agents that work there um, they're patrolling inside the markets. They're checking for safety issues or any other um, things that come to their attention. They're also patrolling outside, and they're patrolling in the parking lots. What are they patrolling? Well, they're issuing uh, summonses for um, idling trucks, um, detached trailers, and other parking like um, expired license, uh, expired inspections, um, registrations. And so is that... Was that Bix role when they were first created? I mean, is is that like under in the in the charter that they're there is you know they can give out you know summonses? 
uh, most of those are part of ECB uh, violations. Yeah. Um, and I believe, yes. Okay. We've, I've gotten complaints and I've heard uh, that inside the markets, BIC has driven around and given cars double parking tickets. Is that happening or under, you know, are you aware if that happens? Uh, I'm not aware of that, but I would imagine if they're obstructing like the throughway or something, you know, for other businesses to be able to function and move from dock to dock or whatever they need to do, uh, they might be issuing those. Um, I have uh, Barreto Point Park in my district, um, and uh, and uh, they have what's called the Floating Lady Pool. It's really cool. I have a five-year-old in the summer. I, I spent it there taking my, my son to the pool certain days out of the week. Um, right on the corner, I, I, absor I observed something very strange. I saw Bic standing on a stop sign waiting to see trucks drive by to see if they're stopping uh, you know, for that stop sign. Is, is that big role now in the Hunts Point community to stop trucks in the street if they're not observing the, the local traffic laws? Uh, we do police for things like parking on sidewalks um, and other things that would um, present safety hazards. But I'm unaware that that's, that was the intention of bringing BIC into the markets. If it was to, you know, get rid of organized crime and corruption, I mean, taking a stop sign, I think, is really overstretching your, your role in, in, in Hunts Point. Well, I guess I would have to understand exactly what they, were, what they were questioning them about. I mean, I know there's a transfer station. Is there a transfer station? They are, yeah, there? they are transfer stations. So sometimes there. they could be policing vehicles okay, that okay. are coming that in and sense. out of the transfer station and if they're licensed. Okay, no, that, that makes absolute sense. They are. Well, maybe we can help coordinate this going forward because this is not just isolated yeah. to council. We we are besieged, and I know this small business chair, council member Jonai, is here. Between the amount of violations from city, state, federal, agriculture, there it's not conductive to operating a business that is so dependent for New York City. So I think we need to have part of the task force and the team that's there to have your cooperation to see what's going to be targeted what the owners should be aware of. Uh, I, I'm, I'm on the side of small business always, and I think we've gotten to a tipping point. So we need, you can hear the frustration from Council Member Salamanca and his district. So um, I think what we can do is maybe come back, Council Member, to that, because we've uh, got a couple of panels. I'm, I'm sorry. So why, don't we, why don't we get to some more of yours, and then we'll I'll, get to finish up on I will, I will. I will wrap up my questions with Vic. Um, definitely, I look forward to. I would like to have a one-on-one, a, one -on -one, a, a meeting with my office and, and, and your okay. your office. Um, we have many concerns, you know, and uh, I I really want to see how can we, we can work together um, on this. Um, my last question, um, and I want to know if this is true. Um, a big officer comes into a business, right, and they want to check the IDs uh, of the employees. Um, I'm hearing that they will line, they'll stop business line everyone up, and start asking for IDs. Uh, is, that, is that the procedure? Is that what a big officer does? Well, I believe like on a regular basis, they're going through to make sure that everyone who's in there and, and functioning is supposed to be in there and checking IDs. Um, there are some situations, um, I don't believe it's that frequent, where we will get complaints. And so the only real way could, you know, to, to vet those out could be to do an inspection. How many inspections does uh, the, are, are your big officers required to do weekly? There is no requirement. So there's no, um, you have to, so they just go in on their own? No, I mean, usually it's coordinated, so we do have other investigators right. that do longer-term investigations, gotcha. but, um, you know, I've been with the agency just for a couple of months, and I'm aware of maybe two inspections Got it. in two months. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, so I guess I'll come back for second rounds of questions. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Council Member Joe and I, I know Council Member Machaka was just left, so if we could chance to some questions with the panel we have now, and then uh, we'll keep going. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Salamanca, thank you for those great questions, and I think you touched on many issues which are concerning. Um, in particular, why BIC was formed to begin with and what it has evolved into. And I can't help but think that if the intention was to weed out organized crime, and I believe the argument at that point was this is going to make for a much fairer work environment for the companies, 
that are operating there uh, from being shaken down to being shaken down to where it looks like they were better off under the uh, organized crime scenario because they were able to at least survive. Um, the fees that you're charging of $150 for each employee, $200 for an application for a background check. And Chairman, maybe you can help me on this one. Didn't we just vote to prevent background checks on tenants from being charged more than $25 because we felt it was inappropriate and illegal? And we're allowing BIC to charge $200 for a background check on an employee that may or may not remain there? Can you help me understand the reasoning behind a $200 fee? Well, as I um, responded before, the fees are determined by a cost benefit and a cost analysis, cost benefit analysis with what it costs BIC to perform the investigation. Um, I don't believe we are allowed to charge more than what it costs. Um, so, uh, it's, it's not a revenue. I can do a criminal background check for 25 bucks. You're charging 200. And I'm sure if I negotiated scale, I would be able to reduce that fee. So why are we paying $200 for a criminal background check? When anyone could go online right now and do it for 25? My understanding is that we get we get a formula for the cost-benefit analysis, and then it goes through the commission um, as a whole, and then it goes to OMB. So I don't I can't really speak to that. I don't think anymore. I can research it and see if there's other information I can find for you. What is the source of your funding for the entire for B, for BIC? The city. City how? Are Pardon you a are you a line item in our budget or? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I'll have to get back to you. Chairman, do you know the answer to that? No. I think you, your budget is based on the number of violations and fees that you collect from these businesses that determines um, and licensing fees that you charge. I think that's your budget. I don't know if you're subsidized as a specific line item. Is there anyone that can answer that question? What happens to the money... See, this is why we brought Council Member Joe and I. Go. Go. What happens to the $4,000 fee? Does that go into your budget or does it go into the city coffers budget? I believe it goes into the city coffers. You believe, but you're not sure. I'm almost positive. I don't think so. I think you, that becomes part of your operating budget. And it would make sense because you're charging $200 for a background check based on your expenses. Well, if you were being funded by the city and you were a line item, no one would really care. You're basing your, the charges for the annual fee, I'm sorry, the every two year fee if you're a fish market and the others every three years. <coughs> and, the hundred, and the $200 application fee based on your expenses to operate. Does that make sense? based on our expenses to perform that function or that service that we're doing really for the market to make sure that people, bad actors, are not allowed in the market. So why doesn't BIC control all the other markets? Since you're doing a great job in preventing organized crime, besides Cardin and Hunts Point, why aren't we putting you in charge of school buses, um, the MTA, the Transit Authority, um, to make sure no one's doing any um, uh, fair beating and um, um, a slew of other industries that we can either draw a just arbitrary circle around or ring and say, anyone that falls in this zone, any operation, we're going to oversee, since you're doing such an excellent job of weeding out organized crime. I wish I could answer that, but I think that's beyond the scope of my knowledge or ability to... Address. Do you ever believe that your work will be finished as BIC, that you've weeded out organized crime because apparently the FBI isn't good enough, uh, the NYPD isn't good enough, and if it wasn't for BIC, organized crime would be rampant in the food market, in Hunts Point, and in the carding industry? 
Well, I'm hopeful, but I wouldn't say that I have a lot of confidence. You're, so you're hopeful that you I'm hopeful that one day. Could, I'm hopeful that it could be one day. Um, but based on ongoing work that we're doing right now, uh, I have reason to believe that it's not coming anytime soon. Does the FBI come to you for help in fighting organized crime? Uh, we work both. We work together with them. No, but do they, they come to us, and sometimes yeah. we go to them. How's that relationship? So, Councilmember Joy, I, I think we are in agreement. We're going to have a separate hearing on on Bix policies there. But I want to bring us back into the co-ops who are waiting to testify on on their uh, leases in the future there at Hunts Point. I want to. You can wrap up the big. I, I will wrap it up, Chairman. With <laughs> I'm looking forward to the day that Bic no longer meddles in Hunts Point. Because the longer you continue to harass and penalize and punish these businesses, the sooner they're going to be re looking to relocate. And in case we haven't realized the importance of Hunts Point and what it means for this city and this state, and if we don't value the 8,000 jobs, and if we don't value the tax base that they are, the employment opportunity that they are, um, and the services that they provide, we're going to find ourselves in a very difficult position when they choose to leave and they say enough is enough because they no longer have to be here. They're under too much threat, including the environment, where I believe it was $25 million has been allocated for a resiliency plan to prevent uh, a flooding similar to... Hurricane Sandy, I can't imagine $25 million is enough to put a fence around Hunts Point, let alone protect them from future flooding. I got an $8 million bathroom you can have at uh, Fort Totten if you want. There you go. So for the price of three bathrooms, uh, we are going to protect um, Hunts Point from flooding in the future. Well, I do thank you for expressing uh, your concerns. Um, we have worked jointly with the markets. I mean, uh, the people that are in the markets every day uh, are well aware. Uh, the, the market managers know them. Oh, I'm uh, sure the, they know you. The security department. I don't doubt that one bit. Um, well, Chairman. so we're going During to turn over to Council Member Salamaka for the last. Uh, Chairman, if I just wrap it up with her, because I was just yes. almost at the end. Well, you two could go all day at this point. Yeah. So I can, <laughs> get you a separate room. Um. <laughs> Because she was wrapping up with... Go ahead. I mean to yeah. cut you off. You made a comment, which I found odd, that you don't hear complaints from the market, whether it be about traffic violations or infractions or because you became the traffic police now as well, as well as a DOT to make sure that the trucks are in compliance. You name it. It sounds like you've become the oversight of Hunts Point in every sector field and law enforcement from ticket writing to inspections to qualifications to you you just it's all yours and you said we don't hear from the market would it be shocking for you to understand that they're afraid to complain to the very agency that on one hand has the hammer on the other hand, has a pair of scissors, and it says, which would you like? And we have the option to give you both. Do you think that they would be very willing to complain to you, knowing that your funding exists solely on the number of violations and fees that you collect from them? That you can walk into their establishment like gangbusters, say, hands up, open up all your drawers, don't anybody move, and we're going to be here for months as we go through every piece of paper after you've done your background checks. Well, just to clarify, so I was on site for one of the inspections, and I believe it took 20 minutes. So I think the, the people are, that are working there, the, the owners and the employees, um, are very forthcoming. And most times when, when we're in, like, say, the adjacent area, 
we may come across a business that's unaware that you know they need to register with us and they are usually given um, a notice they're not cited immediately they're given like 30 days um, to get the information together for their application so that they can register um, I think that our enforcement has been judicious um, I know that some background checks might seem uncomplicated uh, but just last month we did have a couple of employees uh, one in the fish market and one in the meat market that were denied working there and one was because of crimes that the person uh, committed while in the market and the other one was someone who has association with organized crime so I think the businesses that are there doing honest business and employing people in the community are probably appreciative of the work that goes into that and I've seen those decisions they're very lengthy they're very thorough and with that, I'm ending this conversation. Uh, we're not getting into a conversation about legitimacy of businesses. This is about Hunt's point. So we're moving on to the questions of a council member, Salamanca, to end with the first panel, and then we're going to end with that. Thank, thank you, you Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, thank you very much for answering our questions. Um, uh, back to uh, EDC. I want to speak on resiliency. <coughs> um, where are we with the, uh, the Hunt's Point Lifelines project? Sure, so I'll be happy to take this and then I'll look to my colleagues maybe for help. So um, right after Sandy, HUD gave um, the opportunity for communities all across kind of the Atlantic shore that had been affected by Sandy to apply to HUD for funding. Um, the Hunts Point community, stakeholders in the market put together kind of like the lifeline proposal, um, which was really um, seeking funding for um, for resiliency at large in the Hunts Point community. Um, the HUD gave uh, a grant of $20 million. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, because we're short on time. Yeah, sure. I, okay, I know you right. want to give us an explanation. There was about $70 million given, right? Where are we? Where are the backup generators? Where are the solar panels? Have they been installed? Yeah. What, what's happening? Yeah, so it was $20 million from the federal government, $51 million for the city. Um, we've gone through design. Uh, as um, Charlie explained earlier, uh, it's for a microgrid project and two solar panel on two schools in the neighborhood. Um, the, the microgrid project will be installed on Site D. We're beginning remediation. We'll be beginning the construction of the project in 2021 with the goal of finishing in 2022. So by 2022, we want to have the microgrid up and running. Um, on the Two solar panel. I don't know if you have. The um, so that, so that, that um, that that funding. When did the city receive that funding? In, in total for that mm -hmm. that project. So what, what fiscal year? The twenty million, I believe, were received in twenty sixteen. Okay. But we can. I'm happy to. I'll double check and. And my line of questioning is, I just don't know why it's taking so long mm -hmm. for EDC to complete this project. It just makes no sense to me. So I think one of the one of the issues that I think is um, I hope you find enlightening is that we we advanced a, a, a concept of a project um, in the last two years. We brought that concept to the community and they rejected it based on environmental justice principles. And well, this, the community like wanted something else. And EDC says, no, we know what's better for you. And we're going to go with this microgrid and solar panels opposed to um, some type of protection wall protection so we, we have a responsibility to the federal funding to do what is called a um, the project has to be able to work on its own we can't build a section of a wall or a section of a project that has to be a project that has full utility in and of itself so what we advanced was studying a resilient microgrid and studying a flood wall what we found was that we could do a resilient microgrid but we needed to add additional funding and that's why the city added an additional 51 million we found that it actually was, from our perspective, it wasn't in, it wasn't the greatest utility to build a wall around Hunts Point to protect against flooding. Um, the buildings, what they need first and foremost above everything, is the protection of their energy source. And by protecting that, we protect the businesses. Um, communities have wanted a wall; they believe that they that that would be the best solution. But we have found that it doesn't have the greatest utility or the best co-benefits to provide, whether it's um, access to the waterfront or even protection against some other risk that Hunts Point is also subject to, as was mentioned earlier, um, a heat wave, a wall won't protect against a heat wave, and that's something that we know could happen and in Hunts Point. Okay. Um, the solar panels, when will they be installed in these two schools? I'll have to get you an answer on that, but we have finished design and we are advancing towards um, procurement for that. When did you finish the design? I'll have to get you an I don't have it right in front of me. You've had this money since 2016. 
Again, that is that is advancing as part of this project. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we were singly we were simply advancing a microgrid and the community said they wanted to have both a better microgrid that was cleaner and then also um, protecting some assets that were in the community. So about a year ago we went back to the drawing board and redesigned what we had originally proposed and brought that back to the community to get their consent to move All right. forward. Um, and then finally, in fiscal year 17, um, for the budget of fiscal year 17, the council allocated $3.45 million uh, for backup generators at the meat market. Where So fiscal year 17. This June, we're going to approve a budget for fiscal year 21. So right now, we're currently in fiscal year 20, 17, 18, 19, 20. Where are we with these backup generators? I mean, the council gave you this money for fiscal year 17. So where we are today, and, and we've discussed this, um, I believe, with you, um, where we are is we, we advanced the design of, of a generating system. Uh, that system has to be sort of uh, adhered to certain EPA uh, regulations. Um, within the last year, the contractor that was um, advancing that project on our behalf was sold to a much larger organization. Um, EPA, which I cannot speak for them, they have different standards for what are considered small manufacturers versus larger manufacturers. Um, the original company that we were um, contracting with was what, the, what EPA considers to be a small manufacturer which has less stringent standards for, for their emissions. When that corporation was bought by a larger one, they had to adhere to a different set of principles. So over the last year, what we've been doing is working with our contractor to advance that, to meet the new um, higher standards by EPA, and we've been negotiating with the meat market to, to get to a place where we can um, put those generators in place by next uh, hurricane season. So we, there's a commitment that this will be resolved by next uh, hurricane season? Yes, there is. And uh, I just want to elaborate on what Charlie said. Uh, I feel the frustration. We, too, are incredibly disappointed, especially considering EDC's very strong track record of delivering projects on time and on budget. So we are all over this, and we are very happy to report at this point uh, that we will have backup power to the market by next hurricane season. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. With that, um, I'd like to thank the panel. I just want to say that there, we've basically just touched on a lot that's going on there. And I think this is the first of a series of hearings that we're going to do on an annual basis. I think it really gives an opportunity for, and I see the different groups that are here, to talk about and really understand the scope of what's happening there, the different businesses that are affected, the growth for here as in New York City, the future of the market's coming, and I think we didn't even touch on the possible, we've been talking about healthier green New York City food options for schools, um, for our students, for, our, our, for every aspect of the city will happen right here, I believe. And I think that's going to be a good new future for that. So we're going to be advocating for seeing those funds distributed and making sure these projects go forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, and then we're going to bring thank up you. Thank you very much. the next panel. Um, if Charlie, you can hang in there. I, I got to bring up the co-op owners, and then because then we only have two panels, so I'd like to bring up the the Hunts Point Produce Market. Joel Feynman, uh, Matt Terizio, Charlie, thank you. <laughs> Phil Grant and Steve Wentman. You guys come on up and get a chance to give your view of what's going on there. <laughs> thank you to you to see. And also, thank you for your hospitality, bringing us around last week. We much appreciate it. So whoever would like to begin first, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Chair Vallone and members, my name is Philip Grant. I'm the general manager of the Hunch Point Produce Market. I'm joined today to my right, Joel Furman, uh, co-president to my left. Stephen Katzman, uh, also co-president, and also to my left, Matthew uh, DiRigo, a member of the board. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, for to, to, thank you for providing us the opportunity to share with you our passion uh, for the Hunts Point Produce Cooperative, Inc., also known simply as Hunts Point Produce. We appreciate you hearing us today, this afternoon, and invite those of you who have not yet taken the tour to call us and join us. 
The market is fully occupied, presently with 31 owners, 33 companies as two of, as two of the owners and their families own two companies. We have outgrown the 113-acre site. We are space constrained, and we are in need of additional refrigerated space in order to efficiently accommodate the produce demands of the city. Sitting in trailers, based on recent study by market management, their finding was that 12,000 pallets were awaiting to be transferred to various warehouses, sitting in over 700 trailers. If, in a, if indeed, if in a unit we would need two additional rows or two buildings to accommodate our space, pallets presently contained in our warehouse stands at 20,000 and 22,000 uh, pallet positions of produce. With our triple net lease, we spend over $18 million this year to maintain our aging, crumbling facility, as, is, as the pictures in our folder indicate. At present, we have approximately 3,000 direct employees, of which 1,300 of the, of, the, of the members are United Brothers of uh, Teamsters 202, providing good paying union jobs. There's a spreadsheet in your folder that indicates that only their salary level, but their pension and welfare are covered. Members contribute $10 a week of their uh, uh, welfare coverage. In addition to Local 202 is the Perishable Food Industry Local 153 with 140 office workers, also receiving pension and welfare with contributions to the welfare fund of $15 per week. Further, our public safety employees belong to the SPBA, Special Patrolman's Benevolent Association, also with good paying jobs and matching IRA savings plans. In order to maintain the operation of the market, we have our own janitorial, groundskeep, maintenance, toll takers, clerical employees, all are members of Local 202. Among the roster of public safety employees is an, is an additional 18 fire guards that are New York State security guards provide an additional protection from fire watch for the facility. The additional coverage is in place until the market can install a new fire alarm system for the warehouse area mandated by Fire Department New York City. The total cost for both the Public Safety Department is $3.7 million. In order to pr properly secure the entrance of the facility, the total cost of, to operate the toll plaza is approximately $1.5 million. Philip, all of these costs, these are within the original lease that was negotiated, and that's currently in effect now? Currently. Okay. Yes. So that's just want to put it in perspective. In order to maintain an aging facility, the cost of maintenance is roughly $2.7 million, while janitorial costs are approximately $1.4 uh, million. The cost of sanitation for the cooperative common property is approximately $1.9 million. And Chairman Vallone, these costs have gone up over the years. And they're shared equally throughout the cooperative? And shared equally. The market moved from Washington Street in, in March of 1967 to its present location. Along with the good paying union jobs, our system includes customers and market vendors who provide various services for cooperatives, cooperative. We have another 1,800 direct employees and 5,000 indirect employees. We have approximately 4,800 active IDs in our system, uh, which uh, equates to approximately 9,800 jobs, uh, indirect and direct. In your folder are cards given to all customers, vendors, and employees relating to food safety. The market is compliant with the Federal Food Safety Modernization Act, which meets all requirements regarding the cold, regarding cold chain. Within a 50-mile radius, the market is, is the primary supplier of fresh produce for 23 million people, or 7% of the population of the United States. Moreover, produce is distributed by merchants and customers as far north as Maine, as far south as Florida, and as far west as Chicago. An incredible 3 billion plus pounds of produce flow through the market yearly, with a customer base that includes the corner push carts to the neighborhood bodegas, to 2,500 independent greengrocers, to Wegmans and Whole Foods, and everything else in between. Most of the city locations do not have adequate refrigeration. As a result, in order to supply the consumer 
your constituency with fresh produce these customers need to shop daily. Of the 25,000 restaurants, we are likely to say if there is produce on the plate, either directly or indirectly, it is coming from Hunch Point Produce Market. Sales at the market have remained steady at approximately 2.4 billion uh, yearly. While terminal markets in the rest of the country are suffering a downtick in business, we flourish because the vast array of ethnicities in this city of ours, the biggest thing slowing down our future expansion is refrigerated space. Our charity donations, as uh, Councilmember uh, Salamanca said, uh, was, is roughly 6.5 uh, million pounds with a dollar value of $6.5 million in donation, and that's above and beyond our lease. Along with the donation of the produce made by the merchants, other financial donations are made throughout the year by both merchants and cooperative. As previously mentioned, due to space constraints, the necessary use of inefficient storage trailers cost the merchants roughly $5.8 million a year, and that's above and outside of our lease additional cost. Insurance of the cooperative and merchants continues to escalate with the present figure of $4.8 million for workers' comp. For the cooperators, it's roughly 4.3 for workers' comp. Our position uh, in the economy of the Bronx has an impact of over $485 million. We're committed to staying an economic force in the Bronx. We have tried for over 25 years to address this failing facility. There's an urgent need for a rebuild in order for the market to be more efficient and productive and complete successful, to, be, to compete successfully in the coming decades. A redevelopment plan would make us more efficient and engender growth to the market to be accompanied by increase in jobs. We need the support of the City Council to move a rebuild project forward so that we can continue to serve the people of the city and the surrounding areas with fresh, healthy produce. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Philip, you definitely have our support, and that's why we have today's hearing, and that's why we came to visit the gentlemen and the sites there, and we thank you for the individual. Uh, it's amazing how each tenant has their own vision, but yet you all operate together. So does any, anyone else want to speak while you're at the table before we do just general comments? Okay. Um, with the lease negotiations going on now, I think what Council Member Salamanca and I can do to advocate the best, and I appreciate the EDC still here, uh, is to realize those very real numbers that you just put out in the growing escalating costs and the great jobs that you're providing, uh, and a lot of that you're doing on your own, and there's issues beyond any individual co-op tenants slash owners from resiliency to environmental federal, state, and local, to BIC, there's so many different layers that impact every one, but impact all of you. Something that I couldn't help but see the plight was the use of the trailers for getting any possible use of the space that you have at the rear between deliveries and space. To me, that was just, it was a crying uh, plight of what you have to deal with to maximize, and it was not a useful use of the space that each co-op tenant slash owner has how how are we going to go forward in the future if there was a a lease in place or a financing mechanism in place would it be safe to say that those trailers would be a thing of the past a good portion of them you would lose. just use the, the microphone and just so we know who's i'm joel fairman i'm one of the co-presidents of the market so to say the trailers will go away i i think would be unrealistic but i would say a good portion of them would go away with the uh, redevelopment of the facility. Because we're not using the space maximizing at all. We're just using enough to maximize possibly getting enough profits. So, so let's just be clear. The market, since its inception, has sat at 100% occupancy. We've never, we've never, I think at one point, maybe we had two units that were vacant and that lasted about an hour. <laughs> so, you know, the merchants do the best that they can with the amount of volume of produce that they bring in they use these trailers. They're in theory, all they are are, are ancillary storage space for their, for their units. So if you measure the trailers out, if you're at 100% occupancy with the trailers, you're occupying 130% of that market on a useful daily basis. 
Now, the merchants don't want to use the trailers. It's not economical for them to use the trailers. First of all, they're burning fossil fuels, which we all know are not a good thing, especially in the South Bronx area because of the high asthma rate that you brought up. So some merchants have had the ability to convert to electric, also not economical. But it's just the fact of bringing product in, taking it off a truck or a train, reloading it onto a trailer for storage for a period of 24 to 48 hours, the economics behind it just doesn't make sense. You're handling product two or three times. It should, in theory, be handled once, twice at most. So it, it, if you it, had the additional space, if you had the additional space, that we're on the same page is what I'm trying to say. Well, that's what I'm just yeah. trying to bring it out what, what, what it entails. So it would make the next generational step would make sense to include that facility should be something that we should be providing to the produce cooperative is the ability to have that expansion incorporated in the next negotiation and, and growth of the market. To me, I'm not saying that there's anyone doing anything wrong in using the trailers. I'm just it's a waste of energy, time, space, and everything by Correct. not even maximizing the space that you have. Correct. Correct. I mean, that, that would be, and that would com not complete, but a certain take away many of the local issues that we're talking about is we're free to maximize that space, would give our tenants the ability to, to have even more growth and would take away a lot of these local concerns. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, and when we sit here and we talk about resiliency and, and the use of the uh, power grid in the market, the market, even if you were to install this resiliency uh, microgrid that, you, that you're talking about putting in, our infrastructure for, for delivering that power to the markets itself is so inadequate that you're basically going to be sending power into an empty block because it's with 67. We have electrical issues that are beyond repair. We've, we've gone to Con Ed and we've gone to the city and state looking for upgrades. We don't even have waterproof Pringle switches, which is the main distribution. And it's, and it's a no-brainer in today's uh, rebuilds to, to include that. We just do, we just replaced four four Pringles. How many have we replaced? Yeah, approximately four. And the city funded it. They're not waterproof. And I think we have eight more to replace. Like I said, I have an eight million dollar bathroom in Fort Totten. If you'd like to have that, also, <laughs> we don't have such great uh, track records. So you know, so it's not that we're sitting here, you know, crying wolf, you know, because because we're, we're really not. We we we're providing jobs and an economic machine for the Bronx, and we have been for the last 50 years, and we want to continue to stay there. I mean, years ago, we had the ability, we, we did have almost have the ability to leave, leave the city. The merchants decided they don't want to leave. They've made a commitment to stay in New York City. They feel that this is their home. And, you know, we talk about this, and we've been talking about it for so many years. It's, it's hard to get everybody on to commit to staying there to, 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 continue, to, to continue to grow within this, the city of New York. Well, we want to make sure that you have the understanding that we're here, and that was when we came to a lot, to, to hear that, to be your advocate, to make sure that the council and, and the EDC and land use now are, are part of that and working with EDC. We have heads nodding to, to, to realize that. We, you know, if we're going to put in a switch to make sure it's waterproof, those are the type of things that we want to be able to be. We're the best city in the world. We want to give the produce in every other section to show this is why. And without you there, our restaurants and our small businesses don't have, see, I was listening, don't have the ability to have the choices of food that are in the markets and the restaurants. Otherwise, you get stuck with the same five or six. See, I was, I was listening. Uh, and so we will, we will make sure that that is happening. But if there was one thing that we could fight for and go into, what, what was the biggest hurdle that you have to face on a daily basis? Uh, is it the, the over violations? Is it the not having the ability to expand? Is it the uh, not certainty of the future of what's happening there? What, what yes. would be a top three of those men? <laughs> because we I, want to take that back. And they're still here. And Cecilia and the rest of the team from EDC is still here. So. Um, my name is Stephen Katzman. I'm co president of the market. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. One of the one of the two biggest fears that we have right now is is a long-term lease. Our lease is going to be up. And while we do a rebuild or negotiate towards a possible rebuild or whatever it's going to be, each one of us as owners in the market right now are sinking millions of dollars into these buildings that we don't own that 
We understand we might move into a new place. We might not. But our lease is up in 2021 at its current rent. Now, is there now, there's an option that kicks in? There's an option that kicks in at fair market value, which EDC has been very open. Separate, yeah. That they're going to, you know, they'll take. If we get to that point, you know, we will sit down and we will talk about it. But it is a fear. And to go to a bank to try and borrow money to put money into your infrastructure with a lease that only has a year and a half, am I right? Yep. A year and a half left. I mean, we actually brought up to EDC the possibility of creating a new specific type of revenue financing just for the co-ops because it's almost impossible whether you're an individual co-op owner or a merchant or a giant conglomerate co-op owner, to get financing from a traditional bank. It's, it's, it's tough. So yeah. we, we want to be able to try to put something in place because it doesn't make sense. We're the city, we're EDC. We should be able to provide a mechanism that can provide that for infrastructure. So something else we're looking into. And, and it's something we're putting into a, a city-owned building and on city land and providing service for all the people in the city. It's... To me, to, I'm prejudiced, but I, yes, to me, it's a no-brainer. We're here for the city, and the city's here for us. We're just looking for a little bit more of the well, us. Good news is you've got Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, I appreciate you process. both walk, doing a tour of the market. For this group? Yes. Uh, first, I really want to thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's, it's not well, easy Member coming from, from you know, the South Bronx getting here to City Hall, so I thank you. Um, so I just want to touch on the question I promised I was going to ask you. Um, the, the fees, that big charge, right? Uh, I know it's $4,000 every three years that they're charging each business. And then the employees, uh, there's a $200 fee. Um, is that also every three years or is that yearly? Do you know? Sir, our employees do not pay that fee. Okay. To, uh, well, I haven't yeah. asked that yet, but thank you for, yeah. No, well, we don't have <laughs> that. But, but could I just get in? <laughs> this is not to say that they're not going to. Right now, Vic said that we handle our own IDs. And that information is sent down to BIC weekly or daily, whatever it's, whenever it's updated. They want to go onto a real-time system. That real-time system is going to create this $250 fee per card because they don't, they're, you know, the criminal element that's in Hunts Point, if they get the information in 24 hours, God only knows what will happen, you know, if they don't have it the same day. So they, they want they want this system in place. We've been we've been fighting them for quite a while on this system. So uh, it's going to come back again. They they've raised the issue again. We sort of ignore it with them, but it's going to come back again. Okay. So that's not going to go away. So so currently, all the businesses in the market uh, pay the employee fees uh, for the BIC. Currently, they don't we, charge. We we pay for the first time the the all the employers. Pay the one-time, get your card fee. Okay. If the card is lost, it's minimal now. I think it's only ten or fifteen dollars to get a replacement card. Right. Under the new system, if that card is lost, it comes with a big fine. I've heard it upwards of two thousand dollars. I, you know, two hundred fifty. I don't know where that number comes from because we haven't dealt with it. But there's a number between that two fifty and two thousand for their system once it's in place. So if if you're if I'm if I'm an employee of yours. Right, and I start today. You you pay for that that card from Bic. Correct. A week down the line, I lose that card, right? My ID card. I'm 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 charged. How much to I get th- a replacement? I think the mark we uh, currently with our existing system, it's either ten or fifteen dollars, yeah, which th- sounds reasonable. Which, which is reasonable under their system, which is the one that they they've been insisting that we put into place. It goes up astronomically. It, it could be. I don't know, two hundred and fifty to 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 a thousand dollars. Well, well we're gonna we're gonna look into that because should I misplace my driver's license, the state of New York DMV does not charge me two hundred bucks to get it. Well, license. we agree with that. You know, all right. Um, and then just one last, uh, two more questions on Bic, and then I'm gonna move on to local hiring. Um, uh, Matt, uh, you, um, I, there's um there's a quote that you stated in the New York Times. I just don't have the date here in this um. The documents that they gave ago. me. It says, um, and it has you quoted as, Big feels they have an open-ended power to oversee everything done by management of this market. We fundamentally disagree. Their mission begins and ends with organized crime. So in, in your opinion, how, how are they overreaching? 
Well, first, I'd like to know if anybody from Bic is still in the room, but uh, <laughs> they're, they're um, watching live. Watching, 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 watching. Just joking, everybody. Um, well, it, was, it goes to what you were getting at when you were questioning uh, the commissioner. When this all started with the local law and with the carting companies, and I believe there was the gambling, some, uh, yeah, some, sh yeah. they, they, they grabbed the markets and put it all into this big circle, like uh, the uh, councilman was referring to uh, before, uh, and it's just gotten away from what it was supposed to be, and that was rooting out organized crime, and what you were getting out about traffic tickets and we don't need people to write traffic tickets for us in our market we have we have a full staff of security and we self-regulate that's what a triple net lease is all about and that is is strictly not the business of trying to find mount mobsters so what i was referring to and that was a long time ago i have a feeling because i don't remember saying that uh but i just think the mission creep has happened and uh we need to maybe get it back to what uh what they were originally made for because we're on the same page we're businesses trying to run businesses and if a bad guy comes into our market we're not necessarily made to detect those sort of things BIC is so we, we want to work with them about that particular problem keeping the bad guys out but really that's about only what we want to see happen okay what is the average violation that a business gets from BIC what was the last, I mean, if, if you, I'm pretty sure you hear this from your colleagues. Well, I'll, I'll give an example. We, we were just fine. The mic, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. We, we would just find a, a substantial amount of money. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a three or $4,000 for failure to update the personnel file in a timely fashion. And they came back and they said, well, we'll do your favor and it'll only be $500 per person as opposed to the $10,000 that we're allowed to charge her. So that's the type of fines that they, that they regulate when, the, when they decide that it's time to regulate the fine. Um, you know, as far as our customer base that comes into the market, you know, they could be cited from anything from a taillight being out to an uh, uninsured or unlicensed vehicle be, just because they're, they're pulled over. But one point I'd, I'd like to make is, is that Hunt's Point has never, ever said no to, to BIC being an oversight of, in rooting out organized crime. The objection we have is, is that, you know, we're in third and fourth generation businesses, and we're probably all descendants of immigrants into this country. And people come to this country, and they look for jobs to do. And produce is a pretty easy job to do. You buy a box of apples, you go out on a street corner, you sell it, you make $20. You go back, you buy two boxes, you make $40. And sooner or later, you become a small business operating within the five boroughs or outside of New York City. When Bic sits at your gate and questions you for your insurance card or your driver's license or your green card, you chase away that person's dream of coming to this country and being able to deal and offer free at the price society. And that's what has happened, and that's, you know, part of the problem. You cannot park a gate with cameras and armed guards and harass people coming through the gate. Imagine if you were Sears, not Sears and Roebuck, it's a bad example, but imagine if you were R.H. Macy's and you had to pay $5 every time you wanted to go shop and showed yourself ID or whatever the case is. You wouldn't go there anymore. You'd find another place to go. Um, when Big uh, questions your employees, are there, or in the questionnaire, are are is uh, citizenship a question in their questionnaires? I don't know. Anybody, Anybody answer that? No. I don't think so that I can recall. No. And so there is no history of, of BIC, you know, BIC working with ICE and coming into the markets trying to question individuals. No? Okay, I it's just a, that at all. I haven't seen All right, all right, good. Um, now, in terms of local hiring, um, as you're expanding, how are you hiring locally? So I'll grab it. It's, the question is more... Like, how, how could we not? <laughs> um, the history of this has been when we moved out of the Lower West Side in 67, there was a lot of generational uh, fathers hiring sons uh, that went on. And that lasted for a good 20, 25, 30 years. There, there was almost a generational thing going on. Everybody had their son come into the market and work. So what was a Lower West Side draw from 
all around the metropolitan New York area. I wouldn't know just, any of that father the son stuff which you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> Neither do any of us here, actually. We don't know what we're talking about. But uh, the, the generational draw of the market really kept insulated it from local hiring for quite a while. But that wore off. And I would say within the last 20 years, we've gone from maybe a 30% local hired market to I think someone said we were up to 70% local hired uh, in market. And I don't think that will go anywhere but, but up or at least maintain that number. All right. Um, EDC states that there are 3,000 jobs in the produce market. Is that accurate number? I think so. I think. All right. Out of those 3,000, how many are union jobs and how many are non-union jobs? Do you have that number? We have about 1,300 in 202, and then you have uh, 150 something in 153, and then the rest would be day um, workers that are not in either one of the unions. Okay. Um, so you're negotiating with the city, and I know that there's certain information you may not be able to divulge. You're negotiating with the city on providing you with a state-of-the-art facility, which is very much needed. What is the dollar amount that you're asking the city to, to put up? If you can say. If not, we'll just... We, 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 look, listen, we're, we're not builders. We're produce people. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, look at a facility in today's market and you say, you know, $300 million for a refrigerated building, but a refrigerated building may not be what's adequate of running our business. You see, our business is simultaneous. We're, we're bringing product in and at the same time we're moving product out. So the size of the facility matters and, you know, you can't regulate it because our people that, that come into the market early at night that are there between 9 and 1 o'clock in the morning, they're there at that hour, not because it's healthy for them. It's because in order to get that produce back out into Manhattan and to the boroughs, they need to be there at those hours. Then you have another set of people that come in later. So, you know, when you look at the facility and you look at the redevelopment of, of our own businesses, because we're not only a wholesale facility, we're, not, we're also more of a uh, distribution center, you know, we have, to, we have to weigh in how that's going to work. You know, how do you work those two levels? So, you know, we've heard estimates up to, you know, 900 to a billion dollars to, to make it work. So uh, we don't know, okay. but we're waiting. That's what the RFEI is about. We're waiting to see what kind of ideas they come back with. Again, you know, we're, we're produce people. We're not engineers. Yeah. Are you in on those conversations when we're talking about? Are we talking about light rail and barges and the future of all that? Are, are you all at that table? No, we, we've, we've, we've asked. I personally have asked to be included on that, but apparently they have their own idea on how light rail and barging should work in, in the city of New York. We don't, we don't get asked. Well, we'd but, like but, you, you know, you, but in the interim, you have you know a, a company like the Union Pacific Railroad is operating a facility in was it Schenectady, R Rotterdam, yeah, right, right, Rotterdam, right. Rotterdam, New York, where they where they're not even they're actually undercutting their own market so that they don't have to bring the boxcars into the into the city of New York, so they're offloading them in Rotterdam, and that's putting all of that traffic that normally came into the city, it's putting all that traffic at the tractor trailers and putting it on the very roadways we're trying to empty out. So you know. Really, people should talk to us about it. All right. And my last two questions. Um, storm surge. Do you consider the market vulnerable to storm surge? We didn't. No? <laughs> no? Yes. So how would yeah, you, but now we do. Yeah, we do you, now. How were you affected by Sandy? We were. We were very lucky. We did, You know, the, our community, thankfully, did not get flooded and the market did not get did not get damaged we never lost power should should the storm sandy have hit with high tide what would you have foreseen the impact no, no. that it would have had on your, your the facility? problem that we have is our electrical vaults where the power comes in to the market are at street level and while we can maintain about two-thirds of it ourselves which we do with our old maintenance a third of it's locked up that only con edison people can handle and they do not do proper maintenance on it. If we would have, those four block houses would have gotten water in them, we would have been without power, and I can't possibly tell you how long it would have taken to, re, to replace. All right. Um, will the produce market be attached to these microgrids? Have, have they had conversations with you? We've been told that we're part of that plan. All right. And, and okay. Um, and then my final question, congestion pricing. Pretty, I know that many businesses have called me. You're concerned about what's going to happen um, with congestion pricing um, here in the city of Manhattan. Um, have you done any estimates 
uh, you know, per delivery? What do you feel, uh, you know, your the this congestion pricing, the increase in cost it would have on your day-to-day you -day you operation? The issue was till they decide how much trucks are going to be charged, it's hard to really put a cost on for us. I understand congestion pricing. I understand it for cars. You still go on to uh, we, a block. I still don't, by the way, so you, you don't have you know, a lot of it's, it's 63rd and 2nd. There's 250,000 people living on that one block. I mean, <laughs> how many truckloads of everything does, does that need? No, every office building with copy paper and whatever else it is, these are all prices that will be passed on to some people. It does not get passed on in our environment because we deal with perishables. And if you try and add on a surcharge, you just don't get it. Mm -hmm. So it, we're, not a, we're not a cost plus type of operation. Our industry average has got to be somewhere around 12, 13% gross profit. And you take it down from there. Some as low as 10. We cannot add any of these increased costs to what a package of strawberries would you know, would cost. It's not. We just can't pass it on because if you don't sell that package today, two days from now you're throwing it away. And, and honestly, as a layperson, not even talking from a produce market, you you add this congestion pricing in. Who's going to want to come into the city of New York? What happens to your restaurants and your stores and your office buildings where people do travel in and need and you know need cars to get into Manhattan? I mean, it the, the, it's got to negatively impact you somewhere. You, 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 may, you may get your coffers lined with a few, few dollars in congestion pricing, but I think ultimately you're signing your own death warrant. I just wanted to add one thing about what Steve was saying. The, the inability to tack on pricing. We are a purely supply-demand-driven market. The value of our pro product that we sell changes minute by minute every day. So we don't know what we're going to sell product for. We have no idea, but if it gets cloudy or rainy or snowy, all of your pro all of your markets fall. So the idea that we're going to be able to pass it along is just not valid. The customer and the, the buyer and the seller are like this. It's a negotiated business up there at Hunts Point. It's just completely and totally negotiated business, day to day, transaction by transaction. So we make up, basically when we make our money, very small margin, and do big volume. It's a big city. We're a very big market. Uh, Which is why we're fighting for the larger capital infrastructure concerns and permanent facilities and upgrades at this time, which comes in handy with the lease on the horizon, so that the day-to-day -day business you can do. And I think that's why uh, the timing of this and why we're bringing light to all that is there is so much more that is on your daily plate that we're trying to get you back to doing business versus not being your own landlord of your own property when we can have that negotiated and taken care of. I think there's a balance there we're fighting for, and I think that's part of what today is all about. I just Thank you. wanted to digress one more quick point about... And we're going to allow Council Member Jenner one question, because I promised Charlie Pleck and about two hours ago that he could get up, but apparently he, he is going to be very late for his next thing, and I apologize that to Charlie. But before we let this panel go, Council Member Joe and I, would you like to ask these esteemed owners a question? Th thank you, Chairman, but it's not always about Charlie. And <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my son's named Charlie, too, so uh, yeah, he's <laughs> Look, I, first of all, I'm grateful to you for making the time to be here and share with us um, your visions, your issues, and I have two simple questions. One, were you surprised when Bick made the comment that we, she, and I believe I'm quoting correctly, that we don't hear otherwise from the markets? Like, there's no complaints, everything's fine. That's my understanding of the response. And secondly, but probably more importantly, what is keeping the markets at Hunts Point? What is preventing you from leaving? And I hope that you can answer this in a very open manner. We could probably answer it all in the same voice. We we'll could probably do it in tandem. <laughs> uh, the I'm not that surprised that they would say that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm certainly not surprised by something that Big would say. Uh, in general, for my business, B Big is not a, a big problem for me. They don't hassle my business in particular. 
we pay those those fees though and we kind of scratch our head about the costs why haven't we left two reasons one it's an absolutely monumental undertaking to move a, a two and a half billion dollar industry when you're a co-op with 30 people with 75 different opinions of what you want to do and you're already in the population center of the largest population center in, in the United States so you're ideally located we're, we're like the heart and we pump out the produce around the metropolitan New York area so we're in a good spot the market relocation committee back in the 50s picked Hunts Point as an ideal location for future building because the future growth of population was going north and west to suburbia. They were right, and we're in a good spot. Plus, we have rail, and you can get around. You can get out to the island. It's, it's a good place for the food distribution center. So I think the city is very fortunate for having it there. Those are the two reasons. It's a big move to undertake, and we kind of like where we are. Anyone want to say contrary or add to that? Well, we've had issues with some of the practices of BIC in the past. We've uh, used our lobbyists to champion our cause because nobody wants to have a target on their back and, or the threat or the, just the inclination that there would be a target on your back. So that we don't complain directly to BIC, this it kind of makes sense the way you had said it earlier today. Um, we were real close to moving a few years back. There was a site in the Meadowlands that we were very far along with. We met with the lieutenant governor a couple of times, and Jersey was really welcoming us with open hands, arms, pretty much footing almost the entire bill with tax credits. But again, where we are for our business, we are in the middle of New York. In Manhattan, believe it or not, it's not the center of New York. Hunts Point is. <laughs> we could get to three boroughs with, you know, depending <laughs> on traffic, but short, it's a real short yeah. distance. And honestly, that's what's keeping us. It, it makes sense for us. Um, and most of our workers work there. I have 400 people that work for me. I'd say just about 300 of them are from the Bronx. And that makes it very simple when adverse weather or anything else is there and they enjoy coming to work and they're happy to be there and so are we. With that gentlemen I want to say thank you for spending the majority of the day with us um, and if there are questions that we still need to tackle and go forward all the council members that are here are more than welcome to advocate for you because as you can see that's what we're doing and I'm very happy the EDC stayed through and listen we much appreciate that you heard uh, all the comments. So we have one more panel if they can make their way up, oh, it's over here. Uh, Charlie, come on down. Thank From you, the Hunter you. College, New York Suit Fund. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. Lauren Phillips and also Jerome Nathaniel. I'll pass it on. That is our last panel. So if there's anyone else who signed up late that didn't, this would be the panel that you would be on. <sighs> All right, Charlie, if you want to lead us off. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Let me, let me get this a little closer. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairperson Vallone and the members of the Committee on Economic Development for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding the economic impact of Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. My name is Charles Platkin. I'm providing this testimony on behalf of the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, of which I'm the executive director. The center works with policymakers, community organizations, advocates, and the public to create healthier, more sustainable food environments, and we thank the City Council for their support. Let me start out by saying that uh, the Hunts Point uh, distribution center is extremely valuable to New York City's complicated 
food system. Hunts Point distributes food to 22 million area residents, generates a $5 billion annual economy, and provides approximately 20,000 connected jobs. Clustering of food supplier is beneficial because of cost efficiencies, such as receiving shipments, as well as increased revenue because customers can shop at several nearby food suppliers at the same time, thus providing lower food costs to New Yorkers. Furthermore, the location of Hunts Point gives food suppliers access to a very large employee and customer base, which we've heard. However, the current model and vulnerabilities of Hunts Point is cause for concerns, including but not limited to the risks of natural and man-made disasters, threats from other markets such as Philadelphia, direct dis- distribution from major supermarket chains, upcoming lease renewal, and a lack of transparency regarding Hunts Point operations. The following are a selection of key uh, of several key points and recommendations. Number one, most of us can agree that Hunts Point is vulnerable to a disaster, which is outlined in great detail in my written testimony. However, it's important to note that New York City residents face, face additional vulnerabilities if they're low income, lack mobility, face geographic isolation, or have limited choices of where to purchase food on a daily basis. Number two, there needs to be a greater transparency with all things related to Hunts Point, including details on leases, subleases, waitlists for space, tax breaks, and most specifically, which hasn't been brought up, the details of an emergency preparedness plan, which should be shared with the general public. Number three, invest and continue to invest in Hunts Point and let the public keep track. As we approach the lease renewal of the produce market, we need to invest in the revitalization and make sure that the administration's commitment to invest $150 million stays on course. There should be an updated public website dedicated to keeping track of the many different earmarked funds, including local, federal, and state. Uh, we, need to, we need backup generators right now, number four. We applaud the microgrid plan, but it will not be completed for several years, as we've discussed. It's not acceptable if a disaster strikes in the interim. Uh, and there are available truck generators and things of such uh, of such that could be supplied. Number five, support the proposed barge terminal, which would reduce overall reliance on trucks. And number six, we need more projects like the Green Market Food Hub and should explore hydroponic and greenhouse food production at Hunts Point if possible to encourage food sovereignty. We at the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center stand ready and able to help in any way we can. And thanks again for the opportunity to provide testimony. I didn't mind waiting at all. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. Just real quick on the, uh, what about the educational component? Since you're with the education, I'm always trying to link the schools with our food policy and getting the kids involved, especially within careers and opportunities and healthy food alternatives. The market here is critical and all that, but do, is there a connection there that we can? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that, again, you know, we've been trying to connect Hunts Point to, to uh, ac- academia and including you know uh, city schools and I think it's a it's a slow process and we had a, we did have a, a, a panel two years ago and it was very helpful and we want to have more activity with Hunts Point and integrate them into the New York City school system and I think that that's part of what I mean by transparency and connectivity I think that would be a key step to understanding the next generation's involvement there yeah and and, 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 and I would like gr- to see that within our school system and it would be great to set up a series of tours that's more systematic for uh, our public school system into Hunts Point so they could see how that distribution takes place. That would be great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Vallone and members of the Committee on Economic Development. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding the economic impact of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. <laughs> My name is Lauren Phillips, and I am the Government Relations Manager for the Food Bank for New York City. Food Bank's home in the Hunts Point Market is a 90,000-square-foot warehouse where we safely store and distribute fresh produce, protein, and non-perishable items through partnerships such as with New York City's Emergency Food Assistance Program, also known as EFAP. Uh, Thanks to investments from the City Council, we are also able to distribute personal care products like shampoo, deodorant, diapers, and menstrual products. The inventory stored in our warehouse is delivered daily to a network of nearly 1,000 charities, food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, senior centers, and as as well as schools. Support from the Hunts Point Market makes that possible. Uh, Food Bank relies on donated items, and we are grateful that the produce distributors and wholesalers of the market have been longtime Food Bank donors. 36 years ago, our founders recognized the best way to secure sustainable donations for New York City's food bank was to be neighbors with the other largest food distributors in our city. 
Our relationship with vendors in the market has grown so that the last year alone, the market donated more than one million servings of fresh produce that we distributed to food pantries and soup kitchens in every corner of the city. The importance of the market in serving in times of crisis cannot be underestimated. The early 2019 government shutdown was a hit to New Yorkers who struggled to make ends meet and put a spotlight on what being financially vulnerable means for New York City. That month, as a missed paycheck for federal employees and a gap in SNAP benefits coincided with a snowstorm and a school break, Food Bank was able to mobilize to serve those impacted by creating emergency food packages distributed in uh, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Donations from our partners in the market helped fill emergency bags of fresh produce, protein, dairy, and personal care items to ensure everyone who came through our lines left with essentials. Uh, this was not the first time that our partnership with the market proved critical during a disaster. And as Food Bank is a member of VOAD, the voluntary organization's active in disaster, uh, our work to support those impacted by Hurricane Sandy would also not have been possible without the continued operation of the market. Strengthening its infrastructure to ensure uninterrupted operations in the face of disaster is essential. And we encourage continued investment in resiliency planning and support efforts to ensure its long-term security. We are grateful to be partners with the Hunts Point Market and look forward to continued partnership to do the critical work of feeding New Yorkers in need. Thank you. We were just saying that what you were just saying is probably the grounds for a whole separate hearing topic because that is some critical information. And that. So you have that relationship in times of an emergency with Hunts Point. What other partners will have work with you in times to fill those needs? Within the market, mm -hmm. uh, we've worked with Crasdale and uh, Baldor, I believe. That they're well, not just not just. Hunts, oh. but I'm just saying, how how do you fill that food emergency need? Uh, we have partners with uh, partnerships with grocers, uh, with uh, the members of Grow NYC also help us. Uh, we glean produce with them as well. Uh, and partners sounds like you're on your own. <laughs> sounds like you're putting this all together. We may have to figure out a way to put a, a citywide system in place to make sure you have the resources and needs to do that. Well, we also we're, we're partnered kind of taking with, for granted here. What, well, we're partners with the city as well, like with through EFAP and HRA. Okay. So on um, the state, we work with the with OTDA, um, with for the uh, hunger prevention nutrition assistance program. Another part of that alphabet soup of uh, of programs that assist. We have us. so many acronyms. We love our acronyms. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chairman Vallone and members of the committee. My name is Joe Nathaniel. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Government Relations at City Harvest. Um, similarly, uh, City Harvest is also a food bank in New York City, and we've been rescuing food from a wide network of food retailers, farmers, grocers, kids doing can drives, and redistributing it uh, to a network of 400 plus a different uh, emergency food programs across the five boroughs. Uh, in particular, this year we're on pace to rescue 64 million pounds of perfectly edible food, more than half of which being fresh produce, and delivering that to our network of pantries, soup kitchens, and shelters. 64 million. 64 million pounds. How does that compare to a previous year? Is that going up? Uh, it's been exponentially going up. Um, I could say when I started in 2015, it was about 50 million pounds. And in particular for this hearing, I really want to underline that a lot of that local uh, partnership is doing part to the success of the Hunts Point food market, uh, particularly their produce market and a lot of the support they have given us to, for our local food donations. Uh, in fact, um, they are consistently among our top five local food donors. These past three years, we've rescued five million pounds of perfectly edible food from about 21 different food vendors uh, at the Hunts Point market. So twice a day, um, four times a week, we're sending two to three drivers there who are trained in food safety, vetting through the product, and then picking up from Hunts Point and then redistributing that to uh, programs in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx that are receiving the product. Maybe in the next um, redesign, we have a specific location that can expedite within the market that we have just for the pickup. Yeah, so and, and actually- get additional food uh, in the time frame that you need so that it's, it's, a, it's more focal centralized. I think there might be a way to build in to the next plan at a spot just for mm -hmm. what both of you are doing so that we can immediately get to you before that timeline. Yeah. 
and you know, I wish uh, Myra Gordon was still here, but she's really a, a critical. They're listening. They're watching. <laughs> <laughs> she's a huge part of making sure that you know we're able to you know get through without any issues and, and make it to those you know 21 key vendors that are uh, loading up our truck with produce, uh, really a high quality produce. And in fact, we've been surveying the pantries and the clients, and about 93 to 96 percent of them are saying that it's high quality, it's great variety, and it's meeting their needs. But um, in addition to the food that we're picking up from Hunts Point, I also kind of wanted to take this moment to highlight some of the technical support that it might offer. Uh, I know that there was talks today about the, the rail and barging. Uh, so City Harvest, through our coalition work, we're also um, uh, connected to Vital Brooklyn and some of the conversations that are happening there around uh, the Central Brooklyn Food Co-op and the possibilities there. We also pay a lot of attention to uh, the possibilities of viability of the Good Food Purchasing Program. And it was exciting to hear that brought up because a lot of that uh, can really support some of the um, some of the infrastructural barriers that are involved with possibly having um, some sort of operation in central Brooklyn because there's simply, as they say, there's not enough cold storage space or all those other type of barriers. So really the success of Hunts Point uh, is really hitting so many different parts of that food cycle. It's getting people food at food access points, distribution, processing, and also at food recovery for the pantries and the, and the soup kitchens and shelters, and also technical support for different geographies across our city that are trying to bring in product and for the city to actually uh, source uh, more product for potentially a good food purchasing program. Um, so um, I still like to say that uh, City Harvest, we really welcome the city paying uh, close attention to the viability of the Hunts Park market. Uh, we're long term, uh, long time supporters. We've been working with them for 35 years and uh, we're excited to uh, be a part of that conversation. You could tell you're passionate about it since you didn't even read any of your notes. So I could tell the uh, you guys are <laughs> right on that. So we appreciate that. Council Member Corning, did you have any comments for this panel? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so when we, when we think about economic development, we generally don't think about how it trickles down and the importance of what it means to food insecurity in the city. So from food bank and um, the organizations uh, like it that provide these services, it's really refreshing. I wish everyone had stayed to hear how important, you know, and uh, the viability, not only from an economic development standpoint of the Hunts Point market, is, but to the, the people on the ground that organizations like you food source uh, from and actually service. So in, in I want to say that my district, which is Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, both organizations do tremendous work in. Um, I see Keith Carr in the audience who on the ground has done so much for food security uh, in Bed-Stuy. And we often don't put the two together though. So we often think of economic development and the viability monetarily of places like the Hunts Point Food Market. We don't think about its relationship to food insecurity in the city. So thank you for pointing that out. But again, I wish that EDC was here to hear, and I know they're here and they're watching, but I wish that they could have really heard that testimony because I think it's essential to those families who are living below the margins. In my district in particular, um, while you know we're the epicenter of gentrification, um, and displacement, unfortunately, we see that our food pantries are getting less and the lines are getting longer and there are more families who are in need of this service. So, you know, while I guess, you know, 89% of this hearing was about the economic viability, um, we, don't, we, also, we also don't think about, you know, the food insecurity portion of it and organizations like both of yours that are doing so much to make sure that we, that we food source that in a way that it helps families uh, who need it through nonprofit work. So I just wanted to point that out and, and thank you for the work that you do in my community across the city in the five boroughs, but in particularly in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. I think we're both well, in we're your community, so <laughs> thank you. No, absolutely, absolutely. So I didn't know you I were think you guys <laughs> up on that. I, I swear to God, I had no idea that you were <laughs> But I know that you do, honestly, that you do, that you do excellent work for, for the other constituents who are in, vi in, in vital need of your services. All right. Anything else you guys want to close with? But with that, I want to thank everyone for working and helping out to making today's hearing such a success. Again, thank you to Alex, Emily, Jonathan, and Ahmed, uh, Council Member Corny for his thing, and that ends our hearing. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>